strata's where you can literally read the letter <laughs> um, mm -hmm. to, you know, the other end of that spectrum. So, uh, so thank you, thank you, El Haj, um, and thank you, Zubia. Take it away. Hi, my name is Zubia, and this project was developed through an analysis of the Mobley Sense typeface that was designed by Alejandro Paul in 2003. It is based on the 10 characters found on the cover of a 1960s Blues Note album. Um, it is a very bold typeface that creates its unique visual theme through odd counters, generous curves, and sharp corners. Um, since Mobley Sense is a very bold typeface, this project focuses on reducing the legibility of the letters using hatches. So the 2D transformation of the typeface consists of confusing patterns, patterns interrupting and intersecting each other for the typeface to appear more odd and confusing to the reader. Um, similarly, the 3D transformations are comprised of geometric shapes arranged in a way to make complex 3D patterns that form the 3D letter, while also making it less legible. Here are some more examples. So I picked type H from the Stephen Hall types to de develop my plans and sections. This is the Kansas City Board of Trade Building by Burnham and Root, designed in 1888. I picked this building because I like the idea of a broad building having a wide and central corridor uh, surrounded by multiple rooms. So I implemented the strategy in my floor plans. Each plan consists of different variations of a corridor surrounded by the rooms with the facade made from the 3D patterns. And then in the section, we understand the relationship of the vertical circulation in the sheared buildings from the front and the maximum height of the buildings is 60 feet. Um, the site plan illustrates the already existing museum building with the nine proposed individual buildings on a nine square grid with pathways in between them. The patterns used not only reduce the legibility of the heavy buildings, but also produce a dazzle effect on the eye. The exonometric drawing introduces the extruded 3D patterns of the facade of the buildings that are composed of walls and windows. So the side floor plan shows the variations of lobby spaces on the first floor of the nine buildings with different facade patterns of each building. This is the zoomed floor plan of a housing building that exhibits two housing units here and here with a shared kitchen, living and dining space on the top and the bottom, along with private bedrooms and bathrooms equally divided um, on both sides of the plan. This zoomed plan shows the exhibition space with two exhibition halls on the corners and the core in the middle. So the program animation um, displays the outside entrance of the building. The exhibition space and the lobby space. Uh, this zoomed section is off the housing plan, which shows the lobby on the first floor and the housing units on the second and the third floor. Um, this floor, uh, this section is cutting through a solid point of the facade where we see all solid walls. 
And this Zoom section presents the same housing building from a different site, which is cutting through the glass part of the facade. Uh, this is a 360 degree rotation of the exterior of the letter B building. Um, the zoomed frontal elevation shows the patterns of the facade and the spaces created between the sheared buildings. The right elevation displays the upright buildings and the spaces between them. And then this is a 180 degree rotation of the letter W building. Thank you. Kelly, were you going to make a comment or can we jump in? Go for it. Go for it. I'm kind of quiet. Well, well, thank you so much, Zubia. I, I really love the strategy um, that you pursued in terms of the hatching as a way to reduce um, the legibility of, of the typeface itself and is really making me realize like um, kind of moving beyond, um, or I guess this was the first project where I was no longer trying to make out what the forms of the letters were, which interestingly enough in your strategy to reduce legibility, I still think in most cases, the letters are clear, but it produces this um, really beautiful array of unpredictable facade treatments. And I also love the kind of um, play between solid and void, the, the, the vertical striations um, of varying diagonals that you're getting and that you're producing. I mean, I think it's really magnificent. I was just like imagining this as being this like sort of uh, revisitation of 1960s brutalist concrete architecture, which all of you at UIC know so well, but like kind of, to kind of see it um, as both heavy, but simultaneously very, um, uh, Say like very light and very striated. Um, so I think it's really producing some beautiful effects. The one thing that I'm wondering is uh, why do all of these building forms still have such um, flat roofs? Like, had you had you thought at all, or even their connection with the ground plane? Like once we look at it in section, everything is so respectful of this idea of the existing ground and each floor is being, I'd say this like very um, expressed horizontality. And I'm wondering if you could speak about why wouldn't you also try to disrupt that? I mean, was this thinking about like constructability and about budget or like, like pragmatics or was there a reason that you wanted to kind of maintain that um, horizontality? I wanted to maintain the shape of the letter and didn't think much about the uh, roofs because I was, um, implying the razzle dazzle on the facade of the buildings. It's a good question though, because if you look to your earlier studies before they became buildings and when they were still three-dimensional letters, mm -hmm. they're much more extreme, both in the way, well, not, not so extreme in terms of the way they hit the sky though, they are doing more, I think, than the buildings. Um, but definitely in terms of the way they, they touch the ground and the kind of variety, I think, of, mm -hmm. of those things. Mm -hmm. I mean, just as a last comment, like this array that we're seeing right up here on the mirror screen right now of these studies looking at this hatching and how it results in this striation, I think there's like the simultaneity that you're able to achieve here of legibility, but also a sort of almost complete, like almost like a moray effect where it's starting to um, uh, 
deteriorate, that there's a kind of, I, I, I don't know what the term would be, but maybe it is about this um, simultaneity of legibility and illegibility. Um, that could really be an idea here with the project and maybe you even carry that out into thinking about, you know, the, the, the way that you treat a transition from one programmatic space to another or between interior and exterior or public and private. Could there be some idea um, that maybe is a little bit more, uh, I'm not a big fan of the word risque, but, you know, like risque or provocative in terms of trying to activate new new ways of um even you know dwelling that maybe like a bathroom isn't just completely something that's entirely private but maybe there's kind of moments where you can catch like a glimpse of someone combing their hair or brushing their teeth right <laughs> or, or like sleeping where maybe you get this sense of uh, understanding of someone is asleep or awake based upon the kind of light patterns that are coming out of the space and, and the silhouetting of things but I think it's a really really beautiful study really great project yeah, I, I really agree. I wish um, that you all had more time, that you had more time to really kind of develop the, the interior, uh, because I agree with Whitney that maybe there's somehow that you could have used the studies to push the kind of how you, how you um, think about, uh, I would imagine it would be a different way to live inside of a V than inside of an O, maybe. Um, but when I look at the plan, it kind of looks like it's the same inside the V and inside the O, except the, or inside, I don't even know what the letters are anymore, but, but that maybe some of them are smaller, but that's the only difference. But I would imagine that, um, that you might have, because you have more um, of your, uh, your dazzle effect um, per per interior for the smaller spaces that that would be maybe even like uh, like different types of people might want to live there or it wouldn't be living at all it would be working or somehow that you could make the the study productive on the interior as much as it has been for this for this sort of the skin um, and the kind of light effects that you get within the space I imagine would be really amazing too. I think that your uh, how you situate your project on the site might also you might really look very closely at um, I would I guess I would take the the nine square pathway away for a minute and see if you really need it um, perhaps there's something about what's happening in the building that could inform how you deal with the ground as well. Um, I really agree with the idea of allowing your early studies and how your volumes touch the ground, have that come back a bit more. Um, and then maybe as they as you adjust how your uh, project comes to the ground, you also reimagine the ground at the same time. The ground doesn't have to be flat here. I think it would have based on your early studies, uh, maybe the ground um, adjusts to kind of put your your project up or down in relationship to the to the rest of Chicago. It, and just to add to that, I think with your nine square grid, I agree with Sarah that it seems to me like it's almost like you have these nine different volumes, volumetric strategies that could be working in concert with one another better. And maybe they're respecting the grid too much, but also each one of those nine squares is subdivided, right? And so whether they're divided into four parts or two parts, or maybe some there, it's not so legible. Um, from the top 
another one is down to nine parts. I'm wondering, could you play with the idea of the number of letters in the alphabet, right? I think there's 26. Like, would it be something about that where you're literally using um, the alphabet it's, itself as a way to structure what the subdivision of those types are that they can somehow read collectively, like as a whole. So rather than trying to read a word or a phrase or certain letters, it's really about this idea of the relationship between part to whole or letter to alphabet. Um, and another idea too is about starting to violate the nine square grid, like why, you know, maybe you set it up um, as an initial starting point, but it's almost, uh, you know, thinking about maybe the difference between like your own font and something more like, you know, a, a cursive font or some way of or kind of violating um, the the rules or constraints of the font itself. Yours is very much about this kind of, you know, thickness and, and volume. And um, I don't know if there's something there that could actually uh, loosen up <laughs> the grid. <laughs> Yeah, I think those are, I mean, both really great comments. I think um, the nine square was held uh, from the, you know, midpoint of the semester on. And I think one of the things that I think we start to see both in the perspective and the earlier studies is that these things dial up or down the legibility based on how frontally or on a corner or in the round or understanding them. And so I think like, I think that's a, a really great comment because if you started to loosen the orientation, like the rigidity to which they have frontality, you know, to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south, I think that could actually um, also help with that. Um, I wanna thank you Zubia for the presentation, super concise um, and shift over to Ivan. Um, Ivan is your, screen sharing or just one more thing Zubia this is how we like pack it into the <laughs> transitions but um to Sarah's point about like how do you live in a U how is it different to live in a U versus a T I think what we see is actually it's not from a from a like form or massing standpoint I think you can take on that challenge though by saying what is it like to live in a space that almost has no continuity of wall of like solid wall Right, like every wall in your, whether it's an exterior wall and with very few exceptions, also interior partition walls is kind of divided up right into these kind of strips. So I think that's also a really novel way of thinking about how one lives in a space, right? Like the punch window goes away. Um, so really great points. Thank you so much. Um, Ivan. Ivan's going to take us into like a uh, sort of like a Wizard of Oz, like where it's black and white and then it <laughs> switches to color. So prepare your eyes. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ivan, and the typeface that I study and research is called Punch Label. Um, so this typeface might have originated in the 2000s and is most likely inspired by Cloud Garamond, who is the creator of the font Garamond. Okay, there you go. Um, so this image here shows uh, a breakdown of the anatomy of this typeface, which is very simple. Uh, it consists of not very well-defined letters surrounded by a black rectangular shape that separate, separates words and letters. Um, so based on the research that I did, I decided to use two different techniques to further, further develop into a 3D transformation. Um, so the techniques that I used were punch label, punch cut, and inflating the three-dimensional surface that would resemble a pillow or a, a self form. Um, so um, this transformation from 2D to 3D carried material and gravitational qualities that can be seen on the following letters and soft qualities of the mass. Um, so for the second part of the assignment, uh, I decided to go with type O and the 
is Clinton and Russell Architects. And the reason is because this is very, very similar to the technique that I'm using of punching out letters and creating a courtyard or void inside of this building or mass. Um, so all together resulted in the creation of eight different courtyard towers with shifting voids that became more geometrically rigorous while still maintaining some soft qualities from the previous study. So you can see how the, the punching out of the letters creates this shifting of voids in the interior of the building. Um, so now that we have all the background research, uh, we can move to my final project. So we're going to start with the site located just southwest of UIC in Little Italy. Um, so my proposal is just an extension of the already existing building, which can be seen uh, at the bottom left of this image. Um, so this site consists of eight different buildings that are, are equally spaced and each has its own qualities to it. I'm suggesting an instability in the way each tower is stacked. <clears throat> um, some are going in one direction while others are going in. This allows me to create different uh, variations while still using the same geometries. You can see how some rotate. And, um, <clears throat> so. Uh, also, um, so each building uh, creates different light effects due to the material used on the glass windows of each building. So if we take a closer look, uh, we have this site plan cutting through the ground floor, which showcases the lobby space for each building, uh, along with its school, its void or atrium. Space. Um, each atrium uh, space has four different letters punched out. So you can see on this image M, Y, E, H, Q. So those four different letters create interesting moments within the atrium that are also accessible and can be experienced by anyone living on. Um, or occupying the space, as you can see here. So in this day to night video, what I tried to get across is the way in which the buildings are occupied. So it's very busy during the day, as you can see in this frame. And it gets empty or it's very isolated during the night. I think it's very suggestive of the program of the entire complex. Oops. Um, so on this Zoom plan, I'm cutting through three different buildings. The main one is the housing exhibition building on your bottom left. Um, this plan shows a series of beds along the, um, the walls, which will be the exhibition spaces that have become completely interactive and can only be experienced head headsets. Um, in the middle, we have a series of floating rooms used as short-term housing that can also be experienced by visitors during the day and occupied by residents at night. So you can see here. And then on this section, oh, it's easier to see how and on the beds and they're looking up to see um, the green screens. Can you still hear me? Yes. Um, have... Yeah, every once in a while you cut out, but I can hear okay. Yeah, I'll go to the next. Apple it together. Uh, and then on this, and on this plan, I'm mainly cutting through long term housing, which uh, also starts to divide the plan into a series of more private spaces. Um, this building is only accessible by residents. And bedroom. Uh, 
Let me close up here. Uh, so for this section, um, you can see how the, the walls do not reach the ceiling, which allow light from both sides of the building to penetrate into the interior spaces, um, creating different lighting effects and other atmospheric qualities. <clears throat> <laughs> and this video is just showing you how uh, it's moving from the lobby up to the housing aspect of the building and it just shows how each floor is occupied. And then this video will show you the interactive part of the video. People interacting with the building. Um, Was that a dial up modem sound? <laughs> That's pretty <really> great. <laughs> and this, this images are just close ups of the videos so you can kind of see it better. Um, here's your private housing, long-term long housing unit. Um, the walls don't go all the way to the roof. And then finally, we have uh, these two elevations. So this is just showing you how um, the building has two completely up different sides and um, they, each side has a different quality to it. Love you. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. Sarah, do you want to go first or do you want me to jump Oh, in? sure. <laughs> Why do you go first always? Um, I had a routine. Okay. Well, I <laughs> love, um, I love your, uh, your fat letters your inflatable letters. And um, I guess I am a little bit confused about how you decide or what the, um, how you decide to shift the pillows. Like you could, you made a decision, I guess, instead of having um, one big pillow that you difference out a letter um, you decide to do three, uh, four pillows, um, one pillow per story, basically, and and take the letter out, right? But um, I, I guess you should maybe in your explanation kind of go through that moment because I I guess maybe you, if you did, I missed it completely. That jump to I have the this idea of a pillow with, I, and I pop out these letters and I get something interesting formally. And then all of a sudden I turn them sideways and stack them up instead of, and when you turn them sideways, it's the same letter that's been differenced out each time, but it could be different letters and you could stack up the U on top of the V on top of the W, right? Yeah, um, actually each pillow has a different letter punched out. I don't oh. know. And I yeah. told you that. Sorry. You can kind of see it on this image here. So, Got it. Okay. So this one is, I think it's a B, and then you have a C, and then you have a D, and but it changes on each floor. Okay, a few. Yeah. Then next follow up is it seems like originally the letters that you punched out were much bigger. And now they're they seem to have become a very small, mm -hmm. a very small kind of moment. In, in the overall plan. And um, I don't know, I think, I think maybe one, one solution, which I, I kind of looked around, it doesn't look like anybody did this, so maybe it's not on the table, but if you had um, a very large pillow, that's mm -hmm. the whole size of the nine square, and then you start taking um, letters out of a very large pillow and you put another pillow on top of that, also take very large letters out not necessarily in the same place as where the letters were underneath and do that 
with however many pillows you stack up, I think it gives you more freedoms to, um, I think the reason why you have very small letters or forms punched out of the pillow form is because you're now trying to pack program in mm -hmm. and you just don't have a lot of space. Plus all of a sudden you also have these cores and vertical elements. I think if I were to spend uh, a little bit more time and take everything that you know right now and um, do a, a, a revisit, it would be to take the zone of the nine square and say, that's the pillow. Mm -hmm. okay. And then punch, punch, other pillow, punch, punch, but not in the same place necessarily, but sometimes in the same place. And you can, so where you have like clusters of housing, you punch more. Um, and where you have exhibit, you punch less because maybe you need more horizontal space, whereas in housing, you need more light. Um, but I think you have all the elements. I just radically disagree with the nine square separation of pillows. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So more, like a, more like a stacked mat. Like a pancake instead of pillows. Like with misaligned punches. Yeah. yeah. So the punches can do more for you. Yeah. Or maybe even introducing some degree of informality, because I think this un uniformness of all of the pillows with the letter shapes punched out, it feels a little bit like, you know, a, let's say Scrabble, <laughs> like all of the pieces are the same. And maybe uh, considering it to be more like if you were a kid and building a pillow fort and that it's not like all the pillows and blankets you're using are the same, right? They're kind of this like, um, uh, mix and match of, of odd things. I mean, that's the one thing I was going to say about your project. And, and by the way, I, I, I love it in multiple uh, regards. I mean, I think it's a very, very clear concept. I think it's beautifully developed project, very well presented, super playful, but also incredibly rigorous. I mean, this is, um, I think it's very clear that you've put quite a bit of, of, of work and energy and also enthusiasm into the project. So it's very appreciated um, on our end. I think the thing that I was going to comment on, which I apologize, it might be sort of pushing the project beyond the scope of what was asked of you in the studio. But I think because the project is so developed representationally, I want to get you to maybe jump forward a little bit and consider the material implications of this and as a way to maybe introduce more looseness and even more variety into the project. I mean, maybe this gets back to Sarah's comment of sort of how do you break free from this like initial gesture of the of the of of the unnecessary rigor and structure of the nine square grid. And one thought that I had was, first of all, yeah, what if all the pillows aren't the same? And so if they start to have variable thicknesses and or sizes, are the pillow, could the pillows be maybe in some cases more like dense, like a like a memory foam pillow versus, you know, a kind of like cheap old, you know, <laughs> faux down pillow or, or like a pillow that's sort of lumpy. I know like sometimes if you put, you know, pillows in the washing machine and stuff, they get kind of lumpy or overuse, but that maybe, yeah, exploring this idea of informality. And the reason that I think about that is first the nature of inflatables, right? Is like, could be super DIY and kind of like something you make yourself and kind of rough around the edges or they could be super high tech. And I think there's aspects in your project where I'm starting to see like, oh, that looks a lot like it would be concrete. So that looks like something that would be really hard and fixed, potentially even kind of rough, but then maybe this idea of, um, you know, the, 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 the pillow elements, and of course, these great uh, variety of different, um, voids of like the different letter shapes that are creating these atriums. It was making me think about, sorry, no, I'm talking a lot here, but I'm getting very excited. Um, is making me think of um, a project proposal like Diller Scafidio Renfro's proposal for the Hirschhorn Museum, which was this kind of event space bubble that occupies the void of the Hirschhorn Museum. But I think that play between like concrete and something not only that's like pillowy and light, but maybe something that could also expand and contract and I think your use of color and kind of like thinking about 
the life of the building and its occupants at different times of the day. I was almost imagining like maybe it's a little bit more like this breathing organism where like there's aspects of the building that sort of like, you know, inflates and deflate or, if, or they don't literally have to be inflatable, but maybe this kind of idea of expanding and contracting or this play between heavy and light. So I know I've said more than enough, but thank you for creating such a well, like articulated um, project, both representationally and how you presented it. I think it's really exciting. Thank you, thank you for your comments. Whitney, I know you could talk about inflatable. <laughs> um, this is a perfect project for you. Um, I wanna maybe just as we're switching over, um, Julian, if you wanna take over the reins. Um, thank you, Ivan. Uh, also, I think, you know, heading in maybe the antidote to some of the nine square uh, heaviness and uh, the notion of pillow forts and informality and DIY. Uh, I think we're gonna head into that exact territory <laughs> right now. So thank you both and thank you, Ivan. And Julian, take us to your fort. Hello, so um, so I chose Stencil Creek as my typeface to develop. Um, the typeface um, is a material process where um, there are intentional gaps introduced to the stencil, uh, forcing the lettering to come through as a collection of strokes that are fundamentally apart from one another. And so... <laughs> Sarah, you got an old time uh, phone, <laughs> rotary. Goes well with Ivan's uh, dial up modem. And so the uh, 2D transformation, it plays up the idea of a collection. And so the strokes inflate in size and unravel, freeing themselves from the edges of the stencil outline and beginning to join and layer with the neighboring strokes. Um, suggesting possible three-dimensional moves. And so um, stencil meets uh, the 3D world by literally falling and beginning to pile on top of one another. The transformation creates a dialogue between um, rigid and soft materiality. Letters and symbols come in and out of focus, providing some level of legibility uh, and stability while at other times um, there are, they are more ambiguous. And then, uh, let me go back for a second. And then at the scale, the piles um, act as, at the scale, the piles act as um, small scale domestic spaces similar to um, the bandbox type which is known for having a defined boundary around one room per floor for three floors. And they're all connected through uh, a vertical circulation stair. And that inherent quality is found um, in these piles by a defined sausage perimeter um, that forms very articulated edges and begins to imply zones of spaces in between. This we're looking at a section through uh, the second project that I planned from before. And leading to this project, which is a celebration of work, labor, and pleasure, it is reflective of Habitat for Humanity Homes, where the project puts on full display the demanding process of assembly and disassembly of both formal and informal parts that come together in the form of a building or buildings. After assemblage is complete, then um, more programmatic activities and pleasure is allowed on the site. And then the last scene with the movers truck um, sort of reveals that the site is always in flux. Um, it can be filled end to end. It can be filled end to end. Um, with sausage piles and housing units. But over time, there's a possibility for them to be transported elsewhere and reassembled 
at that particular location. And so this developer's site model site plan is understood as a conceptual problem to understand the multiple relationships between people and objects of varying scales, um, both, both housing units and uh, the sausage piles um, are spread throughout the site. Housing units are volumetric uh, and vary in length and provide long-term housing to visitors. These sausage piles are porous and provide temporary meeting and lounge spaces or other programmatic activities. And so this graphic is showing a moment from the site model, uh, like here, um, where one lifts the sausage pavilion to understand the suggested interior of the propped up sausages. And then this plan is of a 90 foot long housing unit that houses four. Um, each unit is separated by a curtain and has the basic essentials to provide a comfortable stay. The inhabitants um, climb up via a ladder and, and enter through retrofitted openings that act as doors and windows. And each unit basically runs along the length. And then this plan is of a 30 foot long housing unit, uh, which houses two. Um, and these zones are to mark out the, the suggested entry um, by their retrofitted opening. And then this is one of the sausage pavilions. And in both housing units and pavilions, there are moments where formal objects are embedded into the informal geometries, um, while at other times the informal objects um, provide that same function as the formal do. The housing unit, um, the sausages sit atop a series of scaffolding or scaffolds similar to those pavilions, but now one is able to occupy a space of higher elevation it's simplified to a single volume for an easier means of standardization, construction, and transportation if the tenants uh, want to move in the future. And like mentioned before, uh, the sausage pavilions provide temporary meeting space and lounge spaces that can be used in a multitude of ways. Uh, moments where sausages curl around uh, the edge um, or outward suggest similar uh, or smaller activities than the open interior. And then this is a scene from the program animation that highlights the essence of construction. It is hard labor. There is an element of training. And then fun always finds a way in. And there's a, a certain collectiveness at a construction site. And then here we're looking at elevation um, to understand how this secondary formal structure props the informal sausages up and how the spaces available within become quite complex. And here's a... And this is running along the entire length of the, the lot, the site lot. And then I will end with this catalog of sausages and domestic objects that are essentially glued together by the hard efforts of builders and volunteers. And with hard labor put in, um, pleasurable activities are allowed for at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. Mm -hmm. 
I think it's a really fascinating project. I really appreciate, I mean, similar to the last project, this ability to say introduce playfulness, but at the same time in a really rigorous way. I mean, really kind of taking your ideas to the nth degree. Um, and one thing I really appreciate here is the strategy of informality and maybe not only questioning what constitutes you know architecture and building but also who's producing it I mean there's obviously a lot of um, precedents that we could point to and I'm thinking more specifically historic precedents uh, like Constance New Babylon if if you're familiar with the project but um, a conceptual project, but obviously thinking about churning over, I mean, let's say like where architecture becomes more of a scaffolding or framework to then um, in, uh, invite its users to actually create the architecture within it. And I think that um, particularly when we are thinking of the subject of housing and public housing, which oftentimes problematically is a very kind of top-down sensibility about imposing certain ideologies. I mean, I, I really appreciate that this project feels very um, timely and maybe calling into question <laughs> uh, our are both architects and architecture's relationship um, to public housing. Um, a couple of pr very pragmatic questions though, is I guess what goes into the sausage? Did I, did I miss that in terms of if you could clarify, I mean, and, and also if it's not important to you, <laughs> then that's another thing, but I, I mean, it, what, what are these sausages made of? And I understand that it's an idea about having some degree of trained labor, but like the people are collectively building these, right? But, 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 what are they made of? <laughs> yeah, so, or what could they be made of? <laughs> earlier in the weeks, I, I looked at, uh, I think there was a resin pour, but then also potentially 3D printing these, mm -hmm. these pieces so that they can, in a way, become standard and therefore be shipped elsewhere and um, cause an influx of housing elsewhere. Um, but at, at the moment, I know the drawings are sort of showing them as uh, solid, uh, solid pieces that people begin to assemble. And so um, I am looking ahead, but I think some of the drawings aren't reflecting that at the moment. Because I would just add, I mean, I, I, I love the idea of maybe pushing it into the realm of 3D printing and or you could take it to the direction of trying to think about it as being almost like the architectural version of a community quilt, right? <laughs> like literally kind of like re repurposing or reusing materials that maybe themselves are incredibly um, informal. But the reason I ask what it's made of is partly because I want to understand your position as the architect of this or as the kind of, you know, orchestrator of it, uh, to what degree it's intended to be ephemeral versus permanent. So maybe that's a, like a more important starting point of the conversation. I mean, are you treating this as something that's kind of like, you know, seasonal and event-based uh, or would you actually like it to literally protect people from <laughs> the elements? Like, could you survive a Chicago snowstorm in this? <laughs> I think I would like for it to be seasonal rather than permanent. Um, I know a thought we had or I had earlier in the semester was for uh, the secondary structure to sort of provide that stability to these sausages so that they can become um, more stable and, and potentially leaning towards long-term and permanent on the site. I think, you know, the project is really, really beautiful, um, very nicely developed from the beginning ideas to the final animations. I, I think that if I were, I'm only going to offer like maybe one or two recommendations because it, it is very nicely done. And, and these maybe 
are not exactly what you were imagining, maybe, in terms of um, the direction that it seems to be going in right now, of, of kind of everything uh, casually laid out on the site. But I'm wondering if, um, as a way to address the site and the existing building, if you were um, to not introduce the nine square, but introduce the um, the idea of that kind of uh, infrastructure or structural system, um, if that if there's some kind of grid on the site that a series of holes, literally just post holes, over the whole site, then um, you know one year. People maybe set it up one way in the holes, and the next year they set it up another way. Maybe around the perimeter, there's um, a kind of a permanent grid, three-dimensional um, frame that delineates the site, um, works in, makes a connection to the existing building, and maybe it has permanent um, whatever might want to be permanent. Because I don't know if everything really wants to be temporal. Like I think, if unless you're saying all the housing needs of this neighborhood will be solved somewhere else. And this is really about um, people coming and temporarily staying and then leaving, and that's fine. But if there was some interest in addressing the kind of former um, residents desire to come back that maybe there's a kind of zone a perimeter zone that kind of is permanent mm -hmm. and um, sets up the grid and it's part of the grid uh, maybe it's higher maybe it built up uh, and then completely different recommendation and that is to think a little bit more you kept talking about how the the entries into the sausages are retrofitted but um, if you're building these, I mean, that might be how you think about them. But I, I imagine that, that you know, someone's thinking about them from the beginning when you're going to build it. And maybe there's an, an, a, set, a study that you do about the, how, you, how you perforate a sausage for access and light and air. And I could imagine there could you. you I'm not sure how it would be done, but I, I know that there's there's many possibilities, and I think that would be interesting for you to kind of take that on, because I think that goes toward Whitney's question of, like, what is it made out of? It's related to that, but also it's like, how do you, how do you take the next step, and how do you kind of actually live and play and work inside of it? It right. could be an interesting thing to think about. And sorry, that was my kid calling on the rotary phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Julian, I just really want to commend you because I think that this project is, it, it, it also pushes, pushes back at a lot of things. I think you're, you're exercising your um, creative skills to call into question. I, I think um, a lot of our preconceived notions about what constitutes housing um, how we can be in dialogue with um, the particularities of a site of varying programs, even all the way down to like who's constructing things. And I really like this idea and I'm wondering, I'm not gonna speak about this in a super articulate way, but I was even thinking about like, let's say um, in like, for instance, in, in Quaker culture, the sort of, you know, communi community raising of the barn, right? So this idea, and I don't know to what extent if this also manifests itself, not only in the kind of civic and public structures, and I'm sure there are plenty of cultures where there's this idea about um, community being involved in uh, the building of, of, of spaces. Um, you know, both public and private. And I think it's a really fascinating one. Um, the other thing that I would really encourage you to think about as a way to sort of situate 
this project, let's say in a more contemporary discourse where it's not just like, oh, we can point back to precedents from let's say the sixties, like New Babylon, Arkazoom, you know, Super Studios, Continuous Monument, like all these other kind of more um, polemic based um, conceptual projects. Um, but would be to ask today, how could this um, negotiate, let's say, cons environmental concerns about um, waste and like what this thing is made of? I love the idea of 3D printing on site somehow, because it's not only employing uh, innovative technologies, but it's also thinking about trying to minimize the amount of resources that are exhausted and the transportation of materials from point A to point B. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's 3D printed, but of what? And how does like the necessary equipment get there? If it's not 3D printed, how might it be made of materials that aren't just like a bunch of, you know, vinyl and plastic or, you know, PVC or things that uh, have potentially could they have more than a single use um but it's really it's 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 a it's a really beautifully represented project really appreciate it. great well thank you everyone um julian great work uh -huh. um and yeah so we're gonna keep moving uh we're a little bit behind but we're gonna um zach and bria can we can you present uh, consecutively, and we'll talk about both projects. Unfortunately, they're very different projects, but um, we'll look at them as a pair. Um, and then I've shuffled things a bit around for the second half. So, uh, Diana, you, I moved you to the second half. Um, you said we're presenting together? Yeah, well, not exactly the same time, but we'll hear from Zach and then Bria, you can you can go next if that works. So they'll, they'll present back to back and then we'll interject with comments after the two. Okay, perfect. That works yeah. great. <laughs> All right, uh, Zach, take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen to my presentation. Uh, is it up on your screen yet? It is. All right. Yeah, I see. Perfect. Uh, start presenting. Uh, so the font uh, that, that is the base of my project uh, is Baskerville. And um, uh, designed in the 1750s, uh, the some basic and uh, defining qualities of the Baskerville font, uh, which I took and explored further in the project, um, include its um, um, elegant qualities, and uh, which uh, sorry if you can hear that. Um, but yeah, it's elegant qualities, which includes its uh, use of the serifs uh, throughout the font, and then also its uh, uh, variance between thick and thin strokes. Um, so from that, I took the, uh, the thin and thick, and then the idea of the serifs. Uh, explored it by um, creating this 2D transformation to uh, cut off uh, the serifs um, as an experiment with the font and then made the thick thicker. So then moving into 3D, um, I took the idea of that serif that I took away, um, but then it just extended it into um, an opposite plane, as you can see. And then you could also see the form of the serif in the back. And then some other models using the same uh, idea. And then moving on into uh, plan study and then uh, turning it, or using the 3D idea now, turning it into a site. So this GIF um, just moving up from the ground, uh, you can see uh, how some parts of the site can uh, get uh, thinner based on the serif design. Um, so the this whole site now is organized uh, within a nine square grid. Um, and then move, moving in, you'll see that, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the grid, it actually takes form within the site. Uh, 
you'll see in this section GIF um, as gates that uh, section off certain uh, buildings for here. Uh, here, moving on, I'll just go to the site plan. Uh, this is the top view. You can see all the different letter forms and how they interact with the gate uh, wall um, to create certain, uh, the, the organization and the uh, choosing of certain letters uh, was to, um, as an overall uh, concept, create courtyard spaces and also um, other public slash private spaces uh, based on uh, mass to surface uh, construction. As you can see the in the thick portions of the buildings here. And then here's an axon to show uh, where the serif uh, the serifing comes into play uh, with some certain ornaments across the whole site on all the separate buildings. Uh, and then here is, let me do a new share. Um, this is my program animation uh, to show certain points within. So this first zooming in is the one of the exhibition spaces, so obviously a public space. You can see um, all inside there. And then the second zoom in will be inside here, uh, which is just a basic unit uh, within one of the housing buildings. And then here is the ground floor plan for the whole site. Um, so you can see um, interior, or on the interior, um, the uh, grid in which the rooms are organized uh, are based on, or the horizontal um, flows with the overall grid of the site, um, while the vertical verticality is slightly italicized um, to give an uh, alternate grid throughout the whole site. And then here's a zoom in of just the basic unit plan, um, where as on each four floors, there are two uh, units uh, for a single family. And then here is just a basic unit of um, a designated public space for uh, residents. And then here's a section uh, cutting through one of the units. And then also on the right, you can also see the courtyard space um, with a um, with the serif formed uh, form um, as a um, decoration to the courtyard, and then underneath that is um, a designated um, exhibition space. And then here's a longer section showing uh, an interior and exterior uh, public space. And then here's just a worm's eye to show one of um, actually this far right building. Uh, this is uh, the original letter that this building takes form of is the N. Uh, so you can see that here and that form uh, lended itself to create this uh, diagonal uh, skylight. And then here are just two um, elevations as well as a uh, yeah, uh, perspective showing these gates with some of the forms in the background. And then just an overall uh, elevation will be. Great, thanks, Zach. Uh, Bria. Um, can you guys see the screen? Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, the original study for the fonts that I started with was Gothic font, specifically Gothic Textura, in which I studied both its context in illuminated manuscripts as a religious decoration, as well as its contemporary context 
as a tattoo on the human body and navigating that surface as um, like a ground zero. Um, in that the letter kind of transformed from something on its own to something that is wrapped around the surface, which as you can see in the right would be um, the letter being wrapped around a ball. That's the primitive shape. From there, the letter itself started to pipe and kind of become its own skin as a sort of way while wrapping around some pretty primitive shapes. We um, have the circle and then I have a square rotated on its top, which is also the angle that the serif of the font is rotated on, as well as some other shapes. And this study, it was kind of abstracted from um, the letter itself. And it's abstracted from focusing on the letter as a readable type to inflating the tubes enough that it becomes a body. And <coughs> the cord with the cylinder was the best way to do that in this one. And so as the cylinders kind of inflated um, an interior, and as we studied the, um, excuse me, as we studied the precedent that was given from our text reference, it went from having an interior courtyard, as you can see from the reference to having a different relationship between exterior and interior and interior and exterior as the points of the pipe actually connect from the ground to the um, fattest part of the pipe. Um, so I have here the site plan and then the first floor cut plan. The letters kind of start to get a certain sense of, sense of density that is a little bit more tight knit than what was previously seen as a sense of community develops, but also um, public program is introduced as a connective tissue that occupies the spaces between room, form, and each, each letter, as well as its relationship to site. Um, this first plan on the right-hand side is the ground floor plan. Moving down the plan on the left is the second floor plan that shows some um, program distinction, as well as on the right, the third floor plan that would show um, kind of how housing could occupy this. And the program itself was where I felt it was most important to kind of bring back the sense of community and the sense of respect and ownership to those that were originating on the site before they were asked to leave, but also um, kind of providing a co-public private space that could be utilized by the community, but also resided in. And then I have some elevations of the exterior form in relationship to the site. Um, Kelly, did you want me to go to the mirror board where we can see all of our drawings side by side? That would be great. They can also, they can also move around, but it's helpful to see them both on the screen. Thanks, Bria. Yeah, no problem. Well, I'll just, um, it's, it's always sometimes challenging to take two projects that are <laughs> seemingly very different, but maybe the, 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 the work cut out for us here in the next few minutes is also to find where there's uh, similarities and crossovers. But I'll begin, Bria, I really, there's something quite fascinating about this idea of wrapping your text around um, these um, you know, these simple shapes, the, the spheres and the, um, and the cubes and so forth. And then this um, uh, inflate strategy, right? Or you were sort of like, um, you know, blowing them up and getting what actually you didn't use. I don't think you used the term, but I couldn't help but think about the way that your um, quote buildings are sort of manifesting themselves is almost like these different clouds or, or clusters. Um, and I think it's really fascinating in terms of them, um, you know, formally and spatially, and also just seeing kind of how radical the transformation here of the original um, 
type was. I think we started off the afternoon with like looking for much more of this literal translation of like, I could still somehow see the letter that's identifiable. And I really appreciate that. It's like now to me, it, it, it no longer matters what the original font was or whether it's an A or a Z or somewhere in between. Um, so I think that this is a really exciting transformation. Um, I was the thing in your project that I'm still not uh, entirely clear of, and maybe this is where it does start to kind of lend itself to a conversation um, about Zach's as well, is you introduce these, let's say, sort of like uh, radically new forms, but somehow they s appear to be at moments in dialogue with the normative meaning something that looks more akin to a conventional building. So is that only, is the, is the kind of conventional building only happening in terms of this um, planned museum? Or are you also looking, it's, it's a little bit hard for me to understand exactly your project. Like let's say in terms of the overall section. So if we look at both Zach and Bria, if you wanted to zoom in on the Miro board so that we're looking maybe even at the, the last horizontal line. So Bria, it seems as though everything you're introducing of these sort of, uh, let's say now instead of being sausages, they're more like these marshmallows, <laughs> these sort of like clustery clouds. So that's permeating the entirety of your site, correct? Like those are the quote buildings and that what okay. I'm seeing as this dark blob, like that's the, um, that's the museum. Correct. Okay. Okay. And then in Zach, in your case, I feel like there's much more of this interplay of a sort of quote, quote unquote, normative building. And then these, this sort of new formal and material language that you're introducing, which is almost these kind of like really beautiful scallops. So that's, um, I'm just asking, I guess, here for like clarifications, but all right, I'll, I'll hand it over to Sarah. <laughs> Bria, um, I think your initial transformation uh, of the Gothic into these applied onto the platonic sphere and then other platonic shapes is really amazing. Um, so I completely agree with Whitney on about that. And how I would recommend to keep working on the project is, of course, it's hard to take that and, and go, okay, you know, like, how do I make how do I make that productive for a building, but I think that in as you are getting bigger and like taking something from it's like a really amazing um, transformation study and kind of pulling it kicking and screaming into kind of program and site and building uh, you've said okay I'm I'm just gonna I guess like get bigger with part of it and um, maybe that's because you're trying to do many of them and you're trying to deal with all of these things. But if if you had more time and oh, maybe like, while it's still fresh in your mind, I would go back and maybe just take one of the transformations and say, okay, maybe that everything is right there. Like I, I don't necessarily have to do nine of them. Maybe I'll just do one of it, one of them and get it really under control. And maybe it only is again, like, you know, the nine square kind of disappears a little bit and this, and the idea of the Gothic um, uh, reference is that it it you know it expands to do whatever it needs to do rather than kind of multiplies, um, and that way perhaps you don't have to in the end have only a portion of the complexity. I don't I'm not I don't want you to keep the complexity just for the complexity, but I do think that there's certain really interesting. Um, spatial qualities that you've gotten that that we don't see at the end um, but that I know you could probably get if you go back and now that you like went through the whole I think it's really productive and I think I've said this like five times but I, I really think that you guys have like just maybe think of I know you probably had like last thing you want to do is do two more weeks of thinking about your project at the end of your college career but 
maybe take a little bit of time off, um, get some sleep. When you come back to it, maybe you're going to come back to it because you're going to work on your portfolio. Um, you know, think about it with everything you have learned. What what happens now? Like, if, can you go back and then redo that? Like, reiterate from a certain point. I think that would really be productive. And I kind of have almost the same, a different but similar comment for Zach. I think maybe Zach, the you know the. In, for me, the, the most interesting part of the project is the is this kind of flying buttress that the serif is this structural element in some moments. Sometimes it, it's it's a upside down and it becomes um, or right side up, but it becomes a kind of really beautiful ceiling. But sometimes it's it's kind of like uh, spanning over and doing like a big scale move that seems like it could be structural. Maybe it's not structural right now, um, but I don't even really care about the structure, just that the effect, the kind of, what it kind of, mm, I don't know, how it makes space is pretty interesting. And I, I think I would think about, is there a way to, to you know, use your transformation. I thought originally your transformation was just to remove the serif, which I thought was really ironic. But actually, you didn't remove it. You just folded it, right? So you folded it back so that it's not visible uh, on first um, reading. But it's if you turn something around, then you see the serif. Um, so I'm wondering if if the serif is this kind of three dimensional move that brings. Oh, the serif got Sarah. <laughs> See if she comes back. Right, it's Sarah, not me, not us. I see Whitney moving, so. I can yeah. still hear you. <laughs> I could, well, I maybe just to add to what Sarah's saying until she pops back on. Um, I mean, Zach, I agree. I think that this idea of, of instead of being uh, so respectful and kind of conforming to the to the rules of the font, I love that your immediate like instinct was <laughs> to actually tweak it and to create your own font. And I think perhaps what she's getting at is like, is there a way to make the residue of what was supposedly trimmed in your case was actually really folded back onto it somehow more celebrated um, within within the strategies of kind of how you you know move forward with um, developing the site. I love her um, comment about this idea of structure and the buttressing of things. And one of the aspects that I found to be really beautiful in your project was this like, and I think it was in one of your animations that was basically taking what I perceived were a bunch of horizontal sections kind of up through the project was the almost like the profiling of the letters themselves in terms of how they oscillated between this, um, between being thin and thick, this kind of, you know, tapering. And I think there's something really extraordinary that could start happening in terms of even thinking about um, if you are working, I mean, I'm just projecting, but like um, here a, a reading of your, um, of your renderings, but even working with a material like concrete, how like at moments it could appear to be so almost like paper thin and really, really delicate. And then in other, um, in other moments in the project, it could be really thick and volumetric. And of course, you know, you could even think about the, the textures, or maybe you say it's not at all about being kind of heavy and permanent and concrete. Maybe it's actually something um, radically different. But I think that there's a really beautiful um, formal spatial language of variation there that's happening. This may be ambiguity too between what is structure and what is surface. I think the one thing in your project that makes it radically different um, from Bria's, I mean, there are many things, but I think it maybe here could serve as an informant, Bria, for your project would be, I think for Zach, is there's the kind of interweaving of I would almost call it like a, a certain normal normalcy of building, right? Like something that we we look at that feels familiar and that then there's this other language weaving through it that somehow subverts it or kind of allows it, us to see it in a new way. 
I say this only because Bria, right now, it seems like you have this like amazing collection of these cloud-like forms that are got this kind of marshmallowy quality to them that haven't yet figured out how they want to be in communication with the existing building. I mean, one way to do it is to be like, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I don't want to be brick. I don't want to be rectilinear. And if that's the case, and I think that's completely fine, then I think maybe there has to be a strategy of finding some way to initiate a dialogue between the two. And that doesn't have to be through three-dimensional built form. It could even be ways of thinking about sight lines in terms of what you see and what you don't. Um, it could also be another strategy that's maybe more on the level of landscaping and thinking about having some kind of ground that is the connecting element between, it's weird to call it old and new because I know the building hasn't been cre created yet, but I think that's really where the work resides in your project, Bria, is to figure out what that relationship is. Um, you know, are you turning your back? Are you really trying to forge a connection? If it's not like Zach's where there's this kind of interweaving, um, then I think that's fine, but there needs to be some position like that, that, that the project takes. But it's kind of fun to see two projects that are so radically different <laughs> in so many ways. And the, 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 the challenge of trying to see how can each learn from the strengths of the other. <laughs> I know it's tough. I mean, it wasn't intended that they would present in Paris, but I think we might have to do that in the second round just to make sure everyone gets gets some time because um, it's a big studio. There's 15 students, and um, and they've you know in some ways done uh, not a thesis, but there's a research component to the the project that has to kind of set up the the work. So it's a lot to get through. Whitney, I really appreciate your time and your thoughts, and I'm glad we got some inflatables in there for you. Well, at least inflatable looking. <laughs> yeah, and I would, and I just want to extend, I want to tell the students that I really appreciate you sharing the work. I know this must be just such a kind of weird way as a kind of, you know, <laughs> grand finale of the semester and to have so little time to unpack what I'm sure has been, um, you know, quite, quite an endeavor this semester. But what I appreciate, and this is also kudos to Kelly, but of course to all the students and their work, just the um, uh, amazing range of strategies that you all started with a font and then seeing not only which font you chose, but then what direction each one of you just, you know, steered it and ran with it. And we have, I think, kind of a really, really beautiful, uh, you know, almost like an architectural rainbow <laughs> um, of, of, of strategies of how to approach this question of um, working with the site and working with questions of public housing and negotiating between public and private space. So anyhow, really excellent work. Happy almost summer, everyone. Thank you, Kelly, for the invite and have a good rest of the uh, review this afternoon. <laughs> see you soon, very yeah. soon. Take care, yeah, bye. <laughs> uh, Margaret and Ramiro. Hi, thanks for joining us. You joined us for closing comments for the first half. Um, so we, uh, we are kind of rushing to catch up with ourselves here. Thanks for coming in a little bit late. Um, so Margaret Griffin is at least in my upper right. Uh, she's faculty at SciArc um, and co-partner of Griffin and Wright Architects in Santa Monica, the menace. <laughs> You're muted. Los Angeles, oh, Culver City, okay. technically, but Los Angeles is the mailing address. Okay, great. We're in LA. Um, and then also joining us from uh, LA is Ramiro Diaz Granados, who's also faculty at SciArc, um, and he directs an architecture studio called Amorphous, um, and also has collaborated with me in the past. So Ramiro, thanks for joining us. Great, thanks. Great to be here. Hey, Margaret. Hey, nice to see everyone. Nice to see you too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so this is a fourth year studio. This is their last, their final, final review. Um, so I know they're looking forward to it for many reasons. Um, did either of you or both of you happen to have a chance to read the syllabus? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Look okay. great. I'll skip over the, the kind of uh, conceptual framework and let the students pick it apart in their individual projects. Um, the one thing I'll I do- 
say one thing. I, I heard it's very beautiful in Chicago now. So after today, you guys can all go outside and it's like beautiful weather. Is that right? Well, it's funny. It was raining earlier, gross, and then the sun just came out. Uh, so now it's this weird kind of steamy environment. In fact, my glasses keep fogging up. But yes, I mean, in general, we've, we've moved past the gnarly part. Yeah, my daughter lives in Chicago, so she was telling me. Yeah, you never know. I mean, it can really get you. Um, can you put the Miro link on the... Oh, yes, I will do that. Um, in fact, I already did that for when Ramiro jumped on, but I will do that here. Um, so I just wanted to, because it doesn't, there's no visual, um, hold on, let me do this this way. There's no visual on the site. So I just want to give you a little bit of context here um, on the syllabus. I think it sets up the conceptual part, but um, so essentially the students um, are looking at type as in typography and typology as in architectural typology um, or building form um, and establishing a kind of family of form. So the project is, is campus uh, oriented um, in the sense that they are taking on a site that um, as early as uh, 2009, this is showing 2003, but as early as 2009, or as late as 2009, I should say, um, looked like this. Um, and this was the site of the, one of Chicago's first public housing developments. Um, it was happening just a year after the country's first uh, ever public housing development, which was in New York in Alphabet City called First Houses. Um, and so this was, um, initially built in 1938. Um, the last remaining building uh, is this one on the lower left. And so you'll see that kind of on repeat in the site plans and also some of the other vi uh, visualizations that you'll see. Um, but essentially it was a, a kind of campus of affordable housing um, of 19 houses, 19 buildings. Um, it was one of the more humane approaches to public housing at the time. So it was the kind of antithesis to Cabrini Green. Um, in the sense that it was low scale and it prioritized the kind of outdoor space between the buildings as much as it did the, the buildings themselves. Um, so in 2009, everything was, was uh, demolished. This building was left and it's um, adjacent to essentially nothing downtown. Um, UIC is just to the east of this. Downtown is just further east of this. Um, so it's in a kind of sleepy part of town, though definitely still within the kind of Chicago center, I would say. Um, and going into that building is uh, currently under renovation by a local architect here is the National Public Housing Museum. Um, and they have a small site in just north of the Chicago Loop, um, but they're looking to move into this last remaining building. And so the students have been charged with um, developing a, what I call an extension to the museum, though because of the kind of campus legacy, uh, you'll see, and I think in this section, you might not see any, but you'll see very few like physical extensions, meaning not many connect to it, but they think of that block, that kind of perimeter block as um, uh, a way in which they can explore uh, the research that they did on typology and typography um, in the form of several buildings. And then each student will kind of take us into some specific Zoom moments um, within their project. Uh, so there'll be a little bit of zooming in and out. Um, so that said, uh, we are going to, I, I, we kind of got to the point at the end of the last group, um, there's 15 students in the studio. So we're kind of cruising a bit quickly through these. Um, and so I hadn't intended them to present in pairs, but I, I think I'm going to do that if that's okay with the critics. Um, again, that it wasn't curated that way. So in the last pair, it was like two very different projects. And um, But if you're okay with that and the students are okay with that, I think we'll have a, a kind of uh, more continuous discussion as well between the projects, despite their differences. Um, so I'm gonna kick it off uh, with Efren and Tony. Um, and while, Efren, while you're sharing screen, um, are there any questions, Margaret and Ramiro? I'm sure there might be. All, all good. Good, okay, quick study. Margaret, you good? Great. 
Margaret's been uh, working or was working with on campus projects similar. Uh, so you're well, and um, Ramira and I both did housing wow. in last semester, and then anyway. Yep. Yeah, we learned that from Ramiro's review. Okay, well, thank you so much, and feel free to ask questions as we go through. Uh, Efren, take it away. Hi, hello, my name is Efren, and uh, the typeface I chose to analyze was the Bungie typeface. Uh, it was designed by David, Th David, Jonathan Ross in 2007. The typeface acknowledges the urban design, urban signs, so pretty much the uh, liquor stores, movie theaters, and uh, the Bungie is mostly used for like short fonts. Um, the bungee typeface was designed to enable to adapt a vertical and horizontal text by stacking one letter on top of the other with the purpose of dramatic use of limited space and, and, and to track attention. Roz, so pretty much Roz design, um, oh, sorry, can you can't see me? You cut out for a second, but you're back. Okay. Um, Rod designed letters that are round and diagonal characters that have a straight sides for vertical stacking. For example, the letter O, the letter A, the M and the the M and the N, and other few other ones. So the transformation of the bungee typeface, I took in consideration of keeping the typeface idea of seeking and working to get people's attention. So I, for my 2D transformation, I use this uh, hypnotized pretty much effect with a slow rotation. For the next GIF, I took my three, 2D transformation and converted it into this 3D object getting this uh, little hill type of style. So that's my GIF, and then uh, here are other examples of other letters. So example, the letter Q from different angles and as well as the letter T. So from the Alphabet City <clears throat> of, by Stephen Hall, I took the Crescent Count building uh, designed in 1905 with the typeface design B. Pretty much uh, the typeface design creates void within the structure that but importantly, the corridors look like they are creating these forms of room between the voice and corridors. So that's why I chose this one. Um, for my plan GIF animation, I use is used to display how the structure changes from moving up, from moving up, and you, you see these pretty much uh, pathways that are created towards the top of the structure. As for my section we are able to see like this vertical, this vertical circulation within the structure as well as these moments where the bridges are visible within the project. For the size plan, we display the existing building location down here, as well as introduce the structures with different gradient for each structure. In the axiometric, we introduce 3D objects from the 2D transformation and place them in the in the, the respective ninth square grid, and we're able to see the different gradients come upon the structures. The ground floor plan is used to show the structures within projects that are all designed to start off with housing units at the ground level and color and are color coded based on each uh, housing unit. So there's a zoom in plan of the letter L, the left bottom portion of it. This plan focuses on ground housing units with the, within the letter L as well as showing other partial units of the structures. So other letters around it. The, these housing units pretty much contain kitchen, living rooms and bedrooms are all different foot, foot square footage, foot square, different square footages, sorry. These housing units around a small public area located in the center of the plan. So like an exhibition. As for my next zoom in, this is a zoom in of the letter O. Was taken at a higher level with the, within the structure. This plan is used to display a more 
public areas within the structures as well allow others to travel within these elevated pathways and we see how the pathways start uh, coming in and working with other structures. Section AA cut about halfway within the letter, we are able to see how the structure goes from wide base at the bottom towards a more narrow space on top. We are able to see how the housing is placed towards the bottom levels and more public areas located towards the top where the set of bridges are beginning to join the structures for individuals to travel upon levels. So for this section, the section uh, BB pretty much cut through letter O. Uh, we tend to see like the centralized void where these individuals have access besides the bridges from moving place. They have the centralized uh, staircase from to move level between levels uh, in the structure. And then for my elevation, we are able to see the pretty much the windows. So like the two floors down here are public, uh, well, they're unit houses. And towards the top, we have the more exhibition pub public areas. This is a zoom in of the ground, pretty much uh, where we're able to see the existing building and also the area between uh, both structures. Another zoom in of the private entrances from the ground level L. So we're able to see within the structures that people are freely to come in and out as they please. And lastly, another image of taken from a top view, look, allowing us to view the pathways on top with individuals, as well as being able to see the individuals at the bottom with the windows popping up. Thank you, friend. Um, so Tony, if you could uh, take over screen share, and then when you finish, just split the difference between the two projects and we can volley back and forth. Volley, rally? that thing. Uh, uh, hello? Hey, Tony, uh, you? Um, the font um, that I chose was um, Impact. Um, the origin of Impact font was first designed using metal casting. The metal casting will give the font its rectangular shape. Impact was used for headlines and display since it was designed to attract attention because of the size of the size and heaviness of the words. Impact became popular in the use of memes. Uh, the type font is bold and has a rectangular geometry that helps the font stand out when placed on top of an image. The font was not uh, important and rarely used in the early years. Um, in 2003, someone made a meme of a cat and used the font impact over the image. The type is preferred font for memes because the rectangular style of the letters and the legibility of the letters help it stand out when using it over um, any image. Uh, impact has two elements that are important for the font to work over an image. The first um, element is the black outline. Uh, the black outline helps the letters have a boundary or a limit of space. The second element is the infill. Uh, Impact uses a white infill, which helps the letters be uh, visible over the image. Uh, the 3D transformation, uh, the black outline becomes a frame and the white infill becomes a mask. The black outline becomes a frame since the black outline is a limit and boundary for the letter, uh, like a frame. Um, and then the, the mass is, um, uh, becomes uh, the infill of the Y becomes the mass. Uh, depending on the mass, uh, the black frame um, starts to hide or reveal the mass that's, that is behind the frame. Um, in some letters, the frame is more um, dominant and it takes, um, it's, yeah, it takes uh, over uh, the space of the view and in other cases, the mass starts to take over. Uh, 
the General Motors building by Amerikan um, architecture shows the building um, using the type H um, in order to create the design. The building has long corridors and are connected to the lobby space. Uh, the rooms are designed to go around the perimeter of the corridors um, and the building is very uh, symmetrical. Um, in the JIP plan, the letters are visible um, because the letters have a rectangular um, geometry. Um, they don't really um, change. Uh, in the section JIP, uh, the letters are uh, no longer visible, yet the rectangular quality of the letters um, is shown by the white rectangular masses. Uh, the black frame starts to support the elevated masses and create covers for other of uh, masses in the project. Uh, the program uh, shows the different activities people can start uh, to do in the interior and exterior of the building. The interior, there are rectangular uh, furniture for people to sit on and many open spaces for people to walk. Uh, there are many masses in which people can climb on uh, and sit on. Um, there are tables, people can enjoy a meal um, there's a st stage for performance, um, and then in the interior is um, for gallery and um, for gallery space and more interactive space. Uh, the side plan shows the mass of the buildings being white and the plates from the frame being a darker gray. Uh, the building starts to separate and be legible since the image of the background seems to be erased to, due to the buildings being a white color. Um, this will be a ground floor plan of the um, of the site. Uh, the zoom in plan shows the organization of the housing. There are two long term living spaces um, in the unit. They are connected um, to a lobby space. There is also a short term living experience with a small room where people will stay uh, for the night and a pool next to um, the housing. Uh, the second zoom plan shows the gallery space. The gallery space starts to show uh, memes, which an image will be uh, incorporated on the floor of the gallery, adding more visual effects to the space. Um, the incorporation of the letters starts to make the plan seem as an um, elevation. Uh, the letters uh, being used will be furniture that will be on the ground floor. The axon takes the viewer uh, from the screen into a uh, picture of the project. The action shows uh, the heavy mass of the building combined with the frame. Sometimes the frame supports uh, the mass or covers the mass. Uh, the zooming section shows the building having two different living conditions um, in one space. The first two floors are for long-term living and the very top floor is for short-term living, um, only for one person and then the bottom ones are for family. Uh, the next um, Zoom section shows the mass of the buildings being supported by black frame. Uh, people can walk underneath the mass or relax in the sitting areas. The elevated mass holds the gallery space, uh, which will be part of the museum. Uh, the difference in height allows people to have a visual, visual of the site from different um, spaces. Uh, the perspective image takes us out, uh, um, takes us um, into the site. There are tables where people can enjoy food and have a talk with friends. Uh, big open spaces between buildings to which many different activities can happen uh, from walking to playing ball. Uh, people can climb the smaller masses in order for them to sit on and have uh, a different view. Um, the elevation uh, shows the difference in height of the buildings. The higher buildings are housing units and the smaller buildings are part of the gallery. Um, and then this is another um, elevation. Um, and then the last image um, incorporates the impact elements of letters and memes qualities. Um, the image shows the letters being able to stand out from the background. Uh, the project is shown in a different scale uh, than before. I guess we'd call this pair the mountains and memes. <laughs> well, um, I'll just say that I think this is like a great setup for a project 
or for a problem. Because um, I think sort of cross fertilizing typology with the issue of type, or or I should say typography, which the, with the issue of type, which is maybe more like typology, I think is a super fascinating idea, especially for housing. We know, for instance, Stephen Hall's book on Alphabet City had to do with how the issue of typography, uh, um, you know, was a means of bringing in light and air into like, sort of, let's call it like mid-rise buildings in New York City. Um, and so I guess one thing that's fascinating to me about this two pairing, the first one, I think, develops a strategy for a kind of echo, for a better way of saying it, a, a kind of um, um, uh, bulbous uh, ing of the initial letter, like it grows and grows and grows until it almost, all the letters almost look alike, right? Like it, it almost becomes indistinguishable. And I wonder on this project, if maybe if you had looked at um, starting to flip the type. So if, if, if right now it's all a pyramid in kind of one direction, right? It always goes smaller to the top. But I wonder if some of them had flipped and if some of them had been an inverse pyramid and others had been a pyramid, then it would have been a little more, um, when you start to take a, a, a kind of cross section or set of plans through the project, it would, uh, it would be a little more um, blurry about the reading. And I also wonder in both of these, and I, I think this issue might come up later, but in general, to what degree does it matter what letter you choose? Like, is it spelling something or is it annotating something or is it saying something? Or is the actual letter uh, only a function of light and air? Or is um, like, like to what degree could this, could using the typography actually have a larger meaning, you know? And maybe that's not on the table, but I feel like it easily could be, you know, um, uh, like, a la Barbara Kruger or something, right? Like you, you could actually be sending a message to the skies if you wanted. On the other hand, maybe the letters and the interpretation of the letters has no meaning, but I, but I think if it's gonna be identifiable, there's something interesting to start to think about. Could it, could it be some sort of acronym or so forth? So what I like about the first one is the blurring of the initial move but I feel like if you had messed with it in section by flipping them, you could have played with that more. And on the second one, I think the attempt was to blur it, let's say through the envelope more so, and through the way that you interpret it um, in the different layers of the ground plane. Um, but I actually think that your very final image where you show it almost like as these furniture pieces I wish those were the actual elevations of your building. Like I wish you had flipped your whole um, your whole typography into elevation and um, messed with like which ones do I read in plan versus which ones do I read in elevation. I, I think like if that final image had less been an image about a way of working out furniture in your project and more an image about like literally the whole building was doing that and a kind of play between which things did that in plan and which things did it, that in section, I think that would be really interesting. Yeah, I also, I, I love the brief. I think it's a, a fantastic setup as well. And I mean, what, what strikes me as one of the main challenges uh, in this as, as kind of what Margaret, Margaret was talking about was, you know, how do you, I think both uh, get the opportunities from typography in terms of how they translate to either um, messing with architectural typology or expanding or redefining architectural typology um, in, in the specific kind of architectural uh, applications that you're looking at. And so when I um, think about the Stephen Hall one, you know, it's interesting. It's like, it's reading the city, reclassifying buildings through a typographic logic uh, but there's all these bizarre like deviations from let's say the typical type of typography because it is particularly architectural, you know, in terms of addressing 
light, access, circulation, all those things. And it's funny, Kel, I don't know uh, if, did you get, do, are you aware of Steingruber, Johann Steingruber? Yes. Did you, did you look at him? Cause like, that's funny. Cause I was thinking like, that's the opposite problem. You know, it's like, right. uh, I guess more like what you're, what you're looking at, but I guess like the bizarre internal configurations of partitioning and circulation within the kind of letter form. Mm -hmm. But, but in that case, the, the extrusion, the kind of Z is always maintained. Right. Like there's, there's no deviation from that. So I think in, in, in this studio, it seems like, how do you find opportunity to not, uh, not be um, kind of overly disciplined by the extrusion of, of the letter form uh, to find ways of breaking it. So I think like in the comment about an Efren's project, you know, the fact that there are always pyramids and you always read the uh, final letter form at the roof that you start to, you know, is you start to ask, like, is there a message here? Is there something I should be reading? Um, one way that you begin to break that down is with the gradient. I really love the use of the gradient because it, it actually reminds me of um, uh, the kind of graphic effect of stencil and spray painting, um, you know, and so at, at that site plan you have, you know, the F is slightly um, illegible, that seems like that could maybe have been uh, pursued more, whether it's through inverting it as Margaret's suggestion suggested, um, or even like if if the hard letter was in the middle somewhere, like not just top or bottom, but somewhere in the middle, so you would get kind of stranger sections uh, that would emerge, and that way when you do an animated plan, you would never you would never see all the letters at once. You would always get like partial uh, letter forms in that sense. But the other, the other thing, the other question I had in Efren's is, and maybe what the the part that I'm not so convinced by are the bridge connections, um, and that being that, I wonder if um, I'm not I'm not sure like what the logic is for how, you know how and where those connections are made. Um, programmatically, I would imagine public spaces, but I guess formally. I guess that that introduces a new problem, and so I wonder, like, oh, okay, does that mean it's like turning, uh, what whatever typeface this is, what is it, the uh, bungee regular to a cursive version of itself, because cursive connects all the letter forms, but the fact that the bridges are independent, they're not the same material or form, it doesn't read as a cursive version of that, and so I guess that that becomes the the kind of really challenging. Uh, aspect of, of, of this scheme. Um, and then in Tony's, I would say, I, I really like this. Um, you know, it's funny when, when you first presented e your take on the um, letter form with this frame, like this black frame, and then the letter, this kind of two part uh, massing of it. I was like, okay, how's that going to work architecturally? And I think the, for me, the more successful places like when i look at that um axon the axon of like the model of, of the project on the table that this idea of that piece almost like as a hydraulic that lifts and then tilts of uh, the different aspect of the letter form because i think then when you would cut plans you would begin to obfuscate the kind of purity of the letter form but I, I, I would I would have liked to see like more of that kind of slippage of this kind of hydraulic of, of the kind of mass versus the stick stick like part of it. And then is that so that that building is existing on the site, the one in the corner and that remains kind of almost C that's on the lower. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, great comments, I think, from both of you. These are not really easy projects to talk about together. Um, and in fact, I think maybe if, if anything, it's good to start with them because it establishes like almost two ends of the spectrum in terms of like the literal and the abstract, which is always part of this conversation, um, was kind of the focus of the midterm for them. Um, but I think Tony, on Tony's side, like impact in trying to develop a, an architecture of the meme, it's like, huge challenge like I, I still don't know, quite know what that is um, but almost establishes like an alibi 
for the literal. Like you almost have to, he almost has to maintain the letter. Whereas I think Ephraim, um, even in your earlier studies, like the whole assessment of Bungie as, and I don't know if you mentioned this, but like the fact that it changes slightly, whether it's used horizontally or vertically, I think sets up the, the possibility of rethinking the consistency of its orientation. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think we get just with these two, I think we, we've gotten into um, some things that will pop up, I think, in other projects. Um, yeah, like um, one thing I want to say about maybe it's Tony's, the first one, that, or Efren, sorry, in the way that he shows the objects in the second row in different orientations. Like, I wish in yours there could be another way of stacking, another way of saying what I was trying to say about like possibly flipping it. it wasn't that it could just be like a literal flip, but like, maybe that second row so shows a possibility of another way of stacking these elements and then re-slice, re-contouring them for the plans such that you could have gotten like not only a less uh, literal um, reading of the, the letters themselves, but you could have gotten like more interesting spaces in between. And there's something in that middle, um, that, that second row where you see different orientations and you could imagine stacking them in these different orientations in a different way and getting a really other kind of result, which could have been super intriguing. Great. Well, thank you so much, Tony. And thank you, Efren, uh, for kicking off this half. Um, let's go to Jordan with Braille. And we'll do the same thing. We'll, um, we'll see Jordan and Lee in this pair. Hi, Jordan. Hi, sorry, just give me a second. Jordan, your birds are louder than my birds. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was just gonna say, someone has birds in their background. That's so cool. <laughs> in spring here, Margaret. <laughs> uh, sorry, can you see my screen? Yeah, very good. Take it away. Okay. So the final setting is the six dot uh, standard font of Braille. So Braille is originally known as nighttime, uh, night writing, which was originally invented by the French army as a tactile, uh, tactile language. But it was later then redeveloped by uh, Lou Braille in 1824 as just the standard Braille that we know now for um, those who have difficulty with vision. So Braille really follows the ideology that it's a very standard thing and everything is very specific to the point where you can't like, you can't change anything even by like the smallest like nudge. It has to be perfectly positioned and it has to follow such strong set standard. So in my iteration, I began to understand the pairings and how everything begins to like follow one logic behind the other. And it breaks down that there is a lot of, uh, everything follows one spe uh, specific way and it's like, and groupings is what they do, as one is raised and one is not. So the white is not raised and black is raised. So for my 3D transformation, I try to understand how I can convert that 2D into a 3D object. And then from the 3D object, how can I begin to understanding the pairing, which is done by stacking my object, my spheres, and then creating an envelope by creating two separate spheres by the groupings and then compressing them both down allowed me to create these uh, intersections between one another, but also create kind of a system of bonding. <clears throat> uh, sorry. So then understanding the bonding, you can begin to see how from the top view, you read the letter as one thing, but in elevation, you also read it as another thing. And it's also the idea that one is always protruding over the other one and one is receding behind. Uh, these are just um, the images. So then from the president study, I was understanding the how horizontal circulation could be utilized, given the fact that in this specific one is that vertical circulation is located in one spot, but horizontal is very more of an experiential thing. And in, this gift, uh, in these gifts in the series is the idea that these spheres and this horizontal circulation is very freeform and is very in the stand and like floating in a space. And then sectionally, you see how these spheres are basically floating within the space that are not necessarily grounded. So 
So then here I begin to understand how I could begin to translate that into the kind of a tactile way bringing back what the original Braille had was with such a level, like a, a level of texture. And so from the axon, I began to study the site. And what I decided was to introduce a primitive shape, which was the cube, which correlates back to the original building itself that is very standardized and follows a set like grid and a set system. And here you can begin to see how like the spheres are beginning to intersect the cubes and how you could begin to like uh, difference them and what that like what that difference can leave or even protrude from the cube and the battle like in the argument of what you begin to read as cube and what it becomes sphere, as you can see in the plans. That once these spheres are beginning to intersect this cube, you begin to read how it can spatially begins to change and like your understanding of the form of the basically the form itself is it whether it's more sphere or is it more cube. And then section lands begins to see how the cube begins to intersect itself within the cube and then begins to difference itself. That you begin to see the relationship of the like how it begins to be in the site. And then here is the idea that I was beginning to believe that programming would originally be something that you'd be able to shift and move around and not necessarily be standardized, but you've been you begin to like utilize the space in multiple different ways and not necessarily as one thing continuously and can be changed whenever and however you wish. So then the elevation here just shows like the relationship of those, uh, of the entire thing. Um, that's it. Thanks, Jordan. Mm -hmm. Um. Hi. Uh... I'm going to share my screen. Hello, Lee. Hello, uh, I'm Lee. And uh, for my project, I begin with the uh, typeface stripe. So uh, this stripe was created by Tony Van Man in uh, 1973. It was for a graphic design company called Letcher Set. And the, uh, and the stripes often appear on the products and in advertising. Um, and the stripes doesn't have, uh, does not have lower case. Uh, users allowed to create variation by just eliminating li uh, lines or, or filling them in. And uh, in the exploration of uh, stripes, I found that this typeface sometimes uh, break up into two or three portions. Uh, sometimes and uh, it continues from one end to the other. Taking the uh, letter E, for example, uh, we can see that the, uh, the letter breaks up two portions, which we can uh, recall the top portion as the arm and bottom as leg and or tail to, uh, through the anatomy analysis. And I start to imagine uh, one of the portion becomes pipes and uh, the other one becomes an uh, enclosed space for uh, architectural purpose. So uh, the top as are uh, the pipes and uh, the bottoms are uh, mainly for uh, space, uh, architectural space. Uh, so uh, here's a 3D transformation. And uh, other uh, 3D letters. So uh, moving on types, uh, I found that this U-shaped building is very interesting. And uh, to me, uh, it seems two buildings connect by a bridge. And I think this is something I can develop my project with. So I begin to connect uh, two 3D letters uh, using the pipes that create that created and uh, as a bridge uh, for the uh, the moving on project. And uh, I also imagine that the pipes in different scale could become a facility for the uh, community services. So uh, I begin to uh, um, manip uh, manipulate uh, with the uh, 3D letters by rotating and uh, extending uh, and ch changing their scale. Uh, here's a collection of the, uh, the building. Uh, the letter building shows uh, how they become a facility through the uh, manipulation. 
uh, one of uh, on the left this one uh, I scaled to a gigantic size mainly for building purpose and the pipes uh, become a bridge that uh, connects to the other buildings as I mentioned uh, and this one I ex I extended the pipes so uh, it becomes a high speed rail for transportation uh, I use a little box to uh, uh, like a, so like a, a chain, a high rail. Um, and this one I rotate it and uh, it becomes a bus stop. And uh, this one I extrude, uh, I scale uh, the size of the pipes and uh, it becomes like uh, also a station where uh, the, uh, the high rail uh, drop off and, uh, the, and uh, I scale it to like uh, a, a seating size for the, uh, the bus stop and uh, this one, the pipes uh, offering uh, a way that like uh, it can become a, a bike uh, by rack and uh, here's a series of uh, the machine uh, system and I will explain later on the uh, along the project. And uh, the one showing uh, the one on the outside is the uh, the fence. By extruding uh, the pipes, it creates a fence, a huge fence. So uh, the side plans um, shows that the way how I organize the buildings. So I basically matching uh, one of the buildings. Uh, matching uh, one end of the building with the other to create a clean organization layout. Like they match uh, this one and this one, uh, like they all matching. <coughs> and um, <coughs> the side plan shows the way how I organize the buildings. Uh, uh, the, I mean, uh, they're so metric. And uh, so basically I, uh, and uh, sorry, no, uh, this uh, isometric shows that the uh, the pipes along the side, across the side, uh, and uh, they are the uh, high rail rack, as I uh, as I mentioned, and uh, these are the bus stop. And, uh, the uh, rack for bike. Hey Lee, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna pick up your speed a little. Can you take oh, a okay. Uh, maybe into the perspectives they have the mural board so they can kind of look around the the plans but maybe just to keep things moving can you okay yeah um so uh with the um defense given i want to create like a uh, agri uh, agricultural fields or for growing plants and a tourism purpose and uh, they can take the plants into uh, the building and uh, these are the series of machines they can, uh, the, the plants can be uh, produced uh, through the, uh, the machine and uh, they become part, uh, products and uh, they can show it, uh, they can be sold on the first level, which is the, uh, the flower shop. So uh, this, uh, is the housing, uh, the Jumin housing plan that shows that uh, how uh, like a micro uh, how a uh, housing unit for a long term uh, single family. And uh, the four floors, uh, that's the exhibition uh, floor, museum, exhibition museum floors, and the uh, the top level is just uh, open space uh, and uh, people can carry around and uh, and these uh, becomes a chair in a very small scale uh, the 3D letters and here's a series of uh, images shows the interior and the uh, exterior and uh, a long section shows the uh, the tracks uh, across the uh, crossing the site uh, and that's it 
Thank you, Lee. Yeah, Lee, in yours, I think the, the thing that's the, that I find to be the, the strongest um, quality in, in translation is the kind of tight terracing, uh, reading the kind of swiping and kind of offsetting and converting it to that. And so how that is inflected on the mass, so sometimes it points, let's say, outward versus inward. So I think there's a, there's a lot of possibility there in terms of the uh, building masses that you're getting and how they begin to populate on the site. What I'm not convinced by, and maybe it's just their lack of development, but the tube connections, like I'm not quite sure. I mean, I guess one, you know, one thing is um, if those bridges as circulation pieces are really uh, critical or necessary, but I guess just as a kind of um, architectural move, maybe they just need, because they're all, they're all ghosted right now, like in all the images. So it's almost like, it's almost like, I'm not really sure about them, or I just haven't developed them yet, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But they, they feel, I'm not sure if they're really necessary. Like there's a, you're getting a lot, I think, out of this um, height stepping of the form, where, where maybe another way that you could have applied that. So like these sunken gardens, or I don't know if they're sunken or not, but you could have imagined doing a, a negative version of that like tight terracing with depressions in the ground. So then you'd have this positive and negative version, and then the composition of those in relationship to each other would create your overall field, I think. Um, it seems like you could have, could, could have done a lot out of it, but there's something really quite clever uh, about that scheme. Yeah, um, I totally agree. What, what I thought was smart um, or strategic about what you did was how you focused on like, let's say the U as a typology within the typography. And it wasn't just U's, there's like sort of P's and J's, but like the kind of emphasizing the, the U and then the relationship of that U to the existing building that remained, I, I think is super smart. But I, I, I wish two things. I do wish that you had um, worked on the whole site such that you could build a better relationship with that existing building. It seems like there's the existing building over here and then you worked in this like cube over here and I wish you had like invaded that existing building more. And uh, I totally agree with, um, Ramiro, that the landscape component that you started to deploy, which I think is super fascinating, that it could have had some uh, topography in that, like not typography, but topography. It could have had some, a little bit of up and down um, to engage the kind of human condition, let's say, uh, maybe just a little bit down and a little bit up such that all of a sudden it makes a space where I could sit or uh, it makes a table, or it makes a place where I can just climb down into, like, like I know that you were imagining it as agrarian, meaning that it could be um, a kind of garden. It seems like you're imagining it as a garden that is about eating things, right? Like, I don't know, trees that provide you with food or plants that provide you with food, but I think it could have also been a kind of occupied garden for the, for the human condition. If you had thought about like, uh, topography just a little bit more. And then on um, Jordan, I think like the abstraction that you get from thinking about the braille as a language is super interesting. Like I, I really like this idea. Um, I have to say that the middle set, like your second row of drawings, I wish those had been the section of your project and not the plan per so much. And I don't really get why you needed to introduce the cubes. Like, I think your whole project could have been this kind of braille, um, the, the, the technique of um, combining the different um, components of the braille for the different parts of the language. And I think the whole thing could have maybe behaved more sectionally um, than it currently is. I mean, in the final rendition, of course, it has sectional qualities. It's not that it doesn't, 
But I think that choice about the cube, um, uh, uh, implementing the cube into it, it held back maybe the, uh, the potential of that second row a little bit to me. Yeah, the Braille is so, it's so tough. That's a tough one because it's so, so abstract. And it's funny because like the more I think about this problem um, and actually in Jordan, in your, the actual um, alphabetical, is that, that's from Alphabetical City, the Lasano Court uh, example. Yeah. So, you know, if you look at that, it's a bizarre, it's a kind of stri slightly strange plan just because the, the shape of the building um, versus the kind of program subdivision and circulation is slightly misfit. So you get some weird post shade that results. So it's it's like one of these things where the there, there's a, there's more material there in the form or shape of the thing that as it interfaces like architectural organization and, and planning that you get some weird stuff that happens. And I think in the Braille, it's so abstract that you kind of have to, I think, I think maybe what the, the move to the sphere is trying to, in, in a sense, um, add to the problem so that some strange things might emerge. But it's funny, but I, I was thinking like, why the sphere and not the cylinder? Um, like, I wonder if the cylinder could have been, because then I think then maybe you could have not had the cube, like you didn't have to say, oh shoot, I need now something that I can make work and then the, the spheres will, you know, um, either e extract from it or add to it. But if it was cylindrical, I wonder if that would have, if you could have found ways to, to manipulate that somehow. The other one is, I mean, I guess similar to um, Lee's in terms of the comment about uh, using the same typographic forms to operate on the ground that I could imagine you could have presented a field of divots. Maybe those are like uh, concave divots in the ground as like the field of the blank kind of braille. And then the, you know, in some cases it might be spheroids that fill it, others it might be cylindrical, you know. So it seems like, like in, in a sense, you needed more stuff, like more of the braille stuff, um, as opposed to um, an extreme form or shape, perhaps. Because in the end, like your field is rather uh, um, light. Like there's not a lot of, you don't have a lot of buildings on the site. They're pretty sparse, right? But when you look at that, the, your, that diagram of the Braille, it's like, it's just like this abstract kind of grid of circles that begins to get uh, filled in, so to speak, to, pr to produce the letters. Like it seems like I, like if I had that, I would have said, okay, I'm going to go excess right away and fill up the site, with this kind of field, and then begin to test out uh, or see where spheroids would occur versus cylinder cylinders and how uh, transformations of those to break the extrusion would, would come in. Yeah, it's funny, Ruro, that you you say that Braille is is difficult. I think it's it's difficult because we, at least I and everyone, no one in the studio can read it. Um, none of us read Braille. Um, we we asked in the beginning, um, and so in some ways, he he's it's almost easier to get to the level of abstraction that I think others were doing a lot of work to do. But I think that level of abstraction makes the building, the typology part, quite a bit more difficult. Um, hence the introduction of the, the cube, which was conceptualized as the kind of uh, thickening of the surface from which Braille gets pushed, you know, in a kind I see. Uh -huh. um, but I think one of the things that's probably not reading is the, the degree to which the, the primitive is intended to show both a concave and a convex, which I think would actually work really well with your suggestion for the ground. And then I think, you know, Margaret, your your assessment of Lee's is, is really great. Like the agricultural part came really late in the project. Um, and then it kind of became all about that. And I think Lee, one of the things that is clear now is that, and I it's, it's kind of funny, we I hadn't thought of this before, but like agriculture and stepped terracing are already so intrinsically tied. And so whether it's a kind of 
you know, negative application into the ground or whether you actually start to scale these things up and maybe implement some of the roof surfaces. Um, it seems like your, your two, well, you've got many systems, but your two primary systems could have been more, a bit more collapsed. Um, so yeah, great readings of, of both projects. Um, and well, as in, and, and as was suggested, it's like, it's like you add, you add topography to typography, to typology. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> too many T's. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Jordan and Lee. Um, we're gonna shift down to the second row and um, I had to move uh, Diana into this group. So Diana, thanks for uh, moving into this group just to even things out a little bit in the two halves. Hi. <laughs> Get away. All right. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Diana. Let me see if I can go ahead and screen share. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay. Um, let me see. Sorry. I'm trying to get used to this thing. I'm sorry. Okay, so here is where I'm going to start. So the typeface that I chose is Myriad Pro. Uh, Myriad Pro was designed by Carol Twombly and Robert Slimbach for Adobe Systems and Marketing Productions. It was created with the intent of developing a neutral, easy to read design. It is a humanist sans serif typeface that could fulfill various uses. This form has a large range um, expanding through different widths and um, weights. So the Myriad family consists of about 40 fonts and is easy and easy to apply to many forms. Um, and is also really, really used throughout like marketing, like for Walmart, Adobe, Wells Fargo and stuff like that and other types of businesses. So here's just like one of the studies that I did of the font. And then a little bit more of that. And then here is one of like the gifts that I use that I created. Let's see if that loads. Um, that kind of just showed my overall, I guess, interpretation of what it would be um, 3D. I don't know if it's gonna play. There you go. So there's that. And then a couple more iterations of some other letters. So down here, I wish you could see that. Um, down here is one of the plans of the presidents that I did, here you go, that I studied also. Um, this was one of the buildings that I, that I kind of looked over to kind of get an idea of what I wanted to do for mine. And then one of the plans of essentially what the ground floor was initially going to look, um, because it is a very standard font, I just, wanted to keep that and its legibility, but also creating a little bit more density. So the idea was to kind of create some thickness um, in which I could use as a body for the buildings. So down here is the overall site plan where you could see the existing building and then overall the area in which I utilize to kind of create public and single family housing. Here's one of the axons where again, you can kind of notice where um, essentially I did create like that depth in order to kind of have the same aesthetic um, and legibility that the font came with because I didn't want to create something too abstract, but mostly just um, emphasize what the building and that letter look like. Um, here is a GIF of some of the residents traveling throughout the area. Um, so this project was intended to keep more of the structural shape of the typeface. However, I wanted to establish some density and um, have a little bit more of office and exhibition space. So here, are one of the housing plans, um, like I said, it is single family. So um, in this floor, basically, it would, this would be like the third floor. You could see um, four of the areas in which families could attend, which would be just one bedroom, bathroom, and like kitchen space. And then here is a plan of the exhibition or office area which residents can also use for different things. 
And then here again is one of the overall plans of what that would look like for the rest of the, the buildings. And then here are some sections. Um, again, just kind of pretty much showing how these would look like. Um, there are some voids in which residents can also travel underneath. You can kind of see like through here. Um, I wanted to achieve a social behavioral space that encourage residents to travel on, around the building and feel part of the area. Um, so those voids kind of allowed the residents to go through and become more of a part of the space. So that's es essentially what I tried to create with this area. Okay. Great, thanks Diana. Uh, Alejandro. Hi, Kelly. Yes. Hi, Alejandro is having connectivity issue. Um, he wanted me to let you know that um, he doesn't know when his connectivity will be back, but he's working on uh, getting it back. Okay, no problem. Yes. Um, uh, hello, Kelly. I'm, I'm working on it. It's just all the, the internet, like the entire uh, little town here, uh, it went out. So I'm using like my phone for internet. So it's very... Uh, are you near Sarah? Hers, hers also went out. That's why she, that's why we lost her at the end of the first half. Are you near Pilsen? Huh? Um, I'm in Burbank, Illinois. So yeah. I even came to another house and still no internet. So it's... Oh, really? Yeah, my mirror is very slow, so sadly I can't. Yeah. <laughs> Kelly, maybe you should share your screen, and then he could uh, describe it. Would that work? Yeah. Uh, maybe if if Alex, you want to share the main board, sure. um, and just go go through the um, yeah the frames. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That'd be better. I can hear you, Alejandro, clearly. So. Wait. Are you can hear me? Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. I'm using my phone, so it doesn't have good internet at all. But, so, <laughs> but uh, I'll try my best um, with what I can do. Um, okay, thanks, thank Alex. You. Thank you, Alex. All right, um, yeah, you can zoom into the uh, Josh me. Um, so here. All right, so first of all, thank you, Alex, and apologies for the internet issues. Um, by Josh was the base uh, or president that I looked at. And in terms of um, the overall design of the type, um, and the components of it in, in terms of ha it having a horizontal and vertical grid. Um, and these, um, hor this horizontal and vertical grid was established in near the 1930s by Joe Smith. And he created the beginning um, iterations of it and was later completed by Flavia Zambardi in 2018. And in terms of the, um, so, uh, and then there, if you want to zoom in, Alex, just to the second uh, board for the, just the geometry, um, the second page there. Thank you. Um, so. One to the right, Alex. So one to the right, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Um, and in terms of uh, the geometry, as you can see, the uh, analysis of the typeface has that. Um, I also at the, um, in terms of transforming the two-dimensional transformation of the typeface, beginning to look at starting to form and um, kind of produce a striation. So more um, uh, kind of carving out the form of the, letter typeface uh, that was existing and started to also look at how to manipulate typeface in terms of two-dimensionality, but also in three-dimensional form um, in terms of rotation of the physical object or uh, physical form typeface. So um, that was the initial beginnings in terms of uh, the transformations. Um, you can now go to the GIF, Alex, and or the fourth board uh, I'm drawing. There we go. Thank you. 
um, here we will be looking at um, studies in terms of the composition and the form of the three-dimensional uh, aspect of the typeface and starting to aggregate um, the forms together to produce a new form. So in a way, how do um, one three-dimensional object starts to um, rotate or in a way loft, be manipulated, lofted, and then later starting to aggregate another object to it and maybe to produce kind of an interesting form or object that could be later comprised as a building and this being grounded. Um, yep, um, you can scroll over to the right, Alex, thank you. And these were just some explorations into that in different types of letter, letters and typefaces um, uh, that either symbols and or letters of um, those two, two dimensional transformations. Yep. You can scroll down, Alec. <laughs> Awesome. Here is um, a bling that I, I studied in terms of looking at the components of the bars that it contained and how could that be used to produce um, livable um, residential uh, spaces. I looked at kind of how um, this rectilinear format and how it's um, designed may impact my project. Um, you can go to the next one, Alex, the GIF. Um, in terms of the plan GIF, um, I looked at kind of, I looked at how um, the rotation of the buildings um, in terms of going in levels of hierarchy um, between uh, levels, um, or as you can say, being extruded upon. Um, you can also kind of see where the vertical cores and the connections between uh, horizontal and vertical circulation are. Um, and those are kind of the beginning studies in terms. And as well as the other GIF presents. This would be the sectional GIF, so just looking at the mass and the form uh, and density of the project um, from the previous. All right, awesome. Don't worry, Alondra, they have the mural link so they can play it on their end. Oh, they can play it? Okay, awesome. Yeah, okay. sorry. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, so yeah, this is just kind of looking at the form of it and how it's uh, being sliced in between throughout the project um, from previous. Um, for midterm. All right, you can go to the next one, Alex. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, great. All right, so now we're looking into uh, the organization of the elements within the exterior in terms of the site plan. Um, in incorporation, these objects are um, in terms of the exterior uh, demand um, like a live, um, play, and learn environment, and these different objects um, that are that we'll be looking into as we get into the drawings um, more um, distinctly. But this is just the overall look and how it's uh, programmed and articulated throughout the site. Um, yep. You can go to the next one, Alex, uh, to the right, to the oblique. Um, thank you. This is looking at the project in term uh, in three dimensional form, an oblique. Um, as you can see, there's various um, various uh, activities present, such as swimming, basketball, um, trampolines, um, and different learning um, environments um, as well, um, and kind of the complexity of the uh, terrace as well, like the terrace aspects, um, and as well as the vertical and horizontal circulation. Uh, of the cores and tubes. Mm -hmm. Go to the next one, Alex. Um, thank you. And this would be the axonometric animation and how the project is being built um, and composed from different elements um, in terms of uh, it being formed from the mass and the rotation of it and 
uh, just the buildup of the project from beginning stages to, to now. Thank you, Alex. Yes. Uh... Yeah, maybe go down to the plans, Alex. Thank you. Yeah, this is good <laughs> Then um, in looking at the uh, floor plan cut at 25 feet, um, we, we look at the organization of these elements and the articulation of furniture um, and how these components begin to divide, uh, as you can say, the organization of the spaces. Um, and it's divided between uh, residential, uh, living, and learning spaces and play spaces as well. So um, here's just kind of an overtop view of how those spaces are organized. And they can either be divided or connected using um, curtains or different um, and openings and doors in terms of uh, privacy um, and how they're organized throughout the space. Um, can you go to the next one, Alex? Here's looking at a zoomed view at the residential space and how um, the livable space would be occupied or used, as well as the articulation of the furniture and how those objects are being represented similar to the exterior um, environment and interior. To the next one, Alex. Thank you. Here's cutting, um, uh, the cutting at ground floor at four feet. And here's the articulation of the points of entry um, and the articulation of windows and how um, lighting might, might come into the space, um, as well as, as you can see, the horizontal and vertical grid that's being presented um, in terms of the 45 degree angle and the rotation of the buildings um, articulate how the individuals circulate uh, between the cores, and the, vertical, uh, the vertical cores. <clears throat> Thank you, Alex. Here are some elevations. Um, here's one elevation to show the how the exterior um, surface or um, aesthetics of the building and how it would be uh, viewed from frontal view, and as well as looking at the relationship of the datum line from um, the housing um, complex, the housing museum, and the articulation of the columns and where those activities are within the exterior. Um, and the organization of space mm -hmm. and the cores as well. To the next one, Alex. Here's a section cutting through and how the programs are evenly divided between uh, a stacked format in terms of floor plates and how the interior space is laid out, um, as well as the, the articulation of the furniture and how that acts also becomes um, part of the program and how uh, the space is being defined between exhibition, uh, livable um, learning, and um, play as well, spaces. You can go to the next one, Alex. Here's another perspective in terms of how um, the division of spaces as well are being between uh, those uh, certain types of programs. Um, and how the individuals um, move throughout um, the horizontal um, tubes um, between uh, one space to the next. Um, yep. All right, you can go to the next one, Alex. I think the next one should be the video. Um, if you guys want to, I, I have the YouTube link attached, so it's easier. All right. So here's a moment where um, the individual uh, interacts with the exterior, and then we'll go to the inside of the building of the project. 
This would be the exhibition space um, in terms of how the layout of the furniture and the objects are, can be presented um, and or oriented. Here's the learning space. Um, and these spaces can be um, divide, uh, interchanged depending on um, the individual, how, how they use it. Um, and maybe it could be switched out in terms of program depending on how they use um, the furniture pieces. Um, between within the building and here's the play area. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you, Alex. And next will be just this uh, view um, to understand how um, <clears throat> an individual might um, be within the space or kind of view the exterior. Um, and also how the, act, the activities are being presented. And as well as here is um, finally looking at the um, organization of furniture pieces um, that are all represented within the project and designed and articulated from uh, a single bench stool uh, all the way to the exterior um, elements such as the trampoline learning space um, and as well as um, <clears throat> the uh, tennis, like tennis and court and basketball. So an additional arrangement of plentiful activities that can go on um, within the project. Um, yeah. And lastly would be the, um, just an animation um, upon all these activities and all the elements that are within the project and how they correlate with one another from livable residential um, learning spaces, play spaces and, and everything um, kind of how their uh, individuals would interact with the objects um, differently, whether lounging, um, playing, and learning. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Alex, too. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, if we could just get both projects on the screen, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks for driving. So, what I, what I find really interesting about the your project, uh, the most recent one, um, let's see, sorry, Alejandro, was um, I really like how you um, abstracted the typography into like a new typography so that it wasn't so much the individual uh, alphabet that we recognized, but it was a set of profiles that you began to deploy in a new way and then the way that you aggregate it to make a new um, field of figural masses um, and figural voids, which I think is really interesting. And I think that you had a nice sectional payoff in your project. Um, one thing that I wish when I see your site plan is I wish that the, especially when I understand uh, your intention about that kind of activities that you are also developing, which presumably would be distributed across the ground plane. On your site plan, I wish that your figural mass wasn't so centered in the middle. Like I, I wish that the kind of figured field of masses could have been a little more distributed such that the these outdoor activities could kind of come to the inside a little bit instead of like only being on the outside. And then by virtue of that, I kind of wish that if you had done that, then it, you could have made a better or, or, or greater conversation with that existing building. But I think there's something super interesting about the language that you created and about the way that the kind of invention by which you started to occupy it. And then I'll just say on the first one, which was Diana, um, again, yours is an example of, uh, well, the most interesting thing that I think that you did was that to develop this nine square grid by which you distributed the, 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 the letters, for lack of a better way of saying it, and then by distributing the letters asymmetrically in this nine square grid of paths, I'm guessing they are, I think you did make a, uh, an interesting set of figural voids. I'm not sure that was like a primary intention, but if it's for sure like an interesting resultant. And again, I kind of wish you had extended your nine square grid, you know, into a 12 square grid to, again, to, to kind of begin to deal with that existing um, 
letter. And then I, 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 I was thinking of the example that I wanted to mention, which is the um, Smith Miller Hawkinson building. I think it was in North Carolina where they, um, uh, uh, where they um, collaborated with Barbara Kruger and they, they wrote a uh, picture this on the ground plane. And it was a, it was a project for a, um, a set of performance spaces. And um, so I, I still think if you're gonna like really see the letters, there could be a way that it, there's some sort of anagram that it makes or some sort of like message it makes to the skies, um, maybe cryptic, but I'm just gonna uh, throw a photograph of the project that I was thinking about on here. But um, I really like in these projects, the way that both projects make a kind of negative space within the project. Yeah, I think I think both of these um, the typeface transformations you guys end up in almost another font or typeface. It seems like, um, and perhaps it has to do with the the level of aggressiveness uh, on the transformation, which is really interesting. Um, I think in Alejandro's. Okay, I have some questions. So I, I agree with the what Margaret was saying about that. Perhaps the massing is too consolidated. Uh, and close to each other. And so I'm trying to figure out like, like what maybe led to that. And I see that you, you had to add these core pieces that, that attached the separate kind of bars or elements of the kind of typeface massing, right? So I was looking at that and I went back to the, to your typeface. And it's funny because you have one of the more abstract ones, right? Because the different parts of the typeface are disconnected. You know, so this is a typeface that relies on a gestalt, meaning that our eye makes a connection because it's graphically not there. Um, but so I think that maybe in your transformation, like it almost looks like you mapped out the circles that make some of those and then those began to excavate more parts of it to, to, to make it more figure, more figural and even more abstract. But I, I could have imagined that in, let's say, the extrusion of this thing, that at some point in the extrusion, the connection gets made, um, but it's not all the way through, right? So you always get some point where it's that abstraction and they're disconnected, but then some, at some point a, a, a connection is made. And then perhaps the, the core that you have to use, I think right now in the massing, it seems that the core is pretty predominant because, you know, typically elevators have to go beyond um, in order for access. But I wonder if um, this is maybe one of those cases where you said, well, what if the parapet is even taller than the elevator? So you get this kind of walled in roof garden so that the cores don't become one of the primary uh, kind of massing. But then if you, if you spread out, then maybe it doesn't have to be as tall. Maybe you have more of them to feel the field because there's something really quite beautiful uh, and, and abstract about these um, kind of massing forms on the site in this field, right? And so I guess that that's part of the, the trick or game is how do you not let certain conventions overwhelm the kind of abstraction that, that you're trying to kind of um, execute uh, in this thing? Um, so I, I think I think those things maybe could, could have helped because you know the other one in the more practical side is that maybe the, when it gets too tight you get like light and air issues um, and things like that. Um, but but really really compelling and you and and I hope you're you 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 kind of use the Frank Gehry window solution that we see in a lot of Frank Gehry projects with with um, developed surfaces. Uh, so that that's that's pretty interesting too. Um, and then Diana, the what I, what, what I what I think is really compelling about yours is the use of the oblique in the extrusion is a way to um, let's say uh, uh, mess uh, uh, mess with or undermine the rigidity of the nine square grid. So you get the obliques that produce overhang that violate the lines of the grid uh, on the paths. And that produce these kind of interesting uh, sections, but also in plan and the overall site plan, you get that too. I think that maybe could have been explored more, like 
right now it seems that they're always the inverse pyramid. Like you have the inverse problem of the first project we saw. Like yours are always inverse pyramids. Whereas one could imagine, um, again, a combination of pyramid, inverse pyramid, also just oblique, right? Just like a kind of shifting uh, of that to produce those things. But I think the, I mean, as Margaret was saying, like as these begin to get put together and assembled, then the negative space between them becomes to get registered. And so by having a, a couple of more formal moves, you can begin to calibrate the, the void or the negative that gets formed uh, in between them. Great. Well, thank you so much, um, both Diana and Alejandra. Alejandra, I'm sorry, you had a rough, uh, rough presentation. <laughs> probably pretty stressful, um, but a very uh, exhaustively worked on project. Um, so I, uh, I'm glad you hung in there for the presentation. Um, okay, we're gonna switch over to our uh, last pair, um, if our critics can hang in. Um, Brian and Alex. Uh, hey, Brian. Uh Hi, so I also have connection issues. I'm using my phone. So let's see if my computer wants to hold out. I tried, I was debating on going to my uncles, both my uncles, but they all, they're both also their internets went out. I live in Cicero, one lives in Berwyn, the other lives in Lyons, and they're all out. Huh. So okay. that's not good. Okay, so well, let, you can, why don't you try to share a screen and see how, how much we get? If all right. I can present your project for you. Just say it's tape, three kinds, four, four kinds. Okay. Yeah, let me see if it will survive. Um, can you see my screen? Yep. All right, I think everything's gonna go well. All right, so hello, my name is Brian and this project originated from the adhesive typeface, which is a version of the black letter variety of a black letter variety and adhesive was created through the use of like layering adhesive tape itself over itself to create specific characters. And through this analysis, I thought that the next step to take was to separate each of these strips into their own like sub into their own little category with um, being the black being electrical, the, the creamy one being a masking tape and the blue being painter's tape. And in continuing to do so, I ended up placing them in a, th we ended up placing them in a more three dimensional space. And through this, because of the thinness of tape, I opted to have them wrap, be a thin layer, kind of like a facade going over a more solid structure, which during this phase was duct a, a duct tape box. And let's see if this will load in the meantime, if the, the internet likes me. And during this, I had the solid structure of duct tape and having them wrap around the structure completely, not just the one certain face of the facade, which primarily would show the main letter. But as it wraps around, it starts losing the context of what it was what it is unless you look at it at a very specific view. And so through this, the, I ended up using the eye letter, I built the eye shaped buildings using the mostly their double loaded corridors as a way to better organize the interior spaces of these, of this project during the first few phases and it's taking so long. That's okay, Brian, they can play them on their end. Okay. And so following this, after having it be the tapes themselves be a more of a facade type, there was a big shift during the halfway point where I ended up adding a lot more massing to the project, re completely removing the duct tape structure that used to hold everything together and allow, and this allowed the tapes themselves, which ended up gaining mass 
to start to interlock with each other and create different spaces and shapes with each of the new letters formed because they would have to hold themselves up in their own way. And so with this state of change on top of it all, they instead of it being just a, a thin layer of um, material for a facade, ended up I opted to have them be a type of stained stucco or concrete to mimic the textural qualities of the tapes used. And in the meantime, the, the site that we used itself, I had laid out with the same three types of tapes to create paths that lead to, that lead and separate each of the nine buildings are within the site. Having them, having a small different variety within each one because none of the buildings themselves are the same and they all have their own different qualities to it with, while also dividing each of the interior spaces as one can see within the, the overall plans over here, overall site plan, where it's divided into three main areas with the vertical, circ circulate, the horizontal circ circulation being a gray tone, allowing it to move, showing where one would be able to easily move more throughout without being stopped really. And then having the, the, ver the vertical core circulation being a light bluish, and then having the more private esque spaces like office spaces, dining areas, and or apartments being the more tan colored of the three spaces. And through this division, and I ended up, ha it also kept the same qualities of how I have the tapes themselves color coded. And these spaces, themselves tend to mostly be at certain points, at least the ground floor, be just a single like eight to 10 feet tall. But this starts changing depending on if where in the building one is like at the end part right here, as one can see through the plan in the section, it can be a normal plan. But the moment we start entering areas where they start, the tape starts like intersecting with each other, the spaces start expanding a lot more. And so more new interior type spaces start getting created because of this, because of how the tapes are end up being stacked and mingle with one another. Also created these interesting little pockets of that one can see through when you look at through the facades the facades and just the elevational views right here. Meanwhile, these images, images on the right and the gifts themselves are here to more help to help signify more of the in-person view of how big the structures themselves are. And to see how the paths themselves and to see to show that they aren't really they aren't hindered by the buildings themselves, but are there to actually help one move throughout the site and Thank that you, is it yeah thanks very much um alex hello hello how is everyone today good okay stormy Thank you. internet Stormy. <laughs> Thanks. Um, are you able to see? Oops. Let me just go back to the very first one. Yep, we can see your screen. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexandra Perusek. And this is my project. Um, so for this project, I analyzed uh, Gilsen's type. It was created by Eric Gill, 
whose goal was to create a typeface that was modern yet classical. Uh, this type is known for its classical proportions and clean lines, as well as its high legibility and readability in both display and body text. The interesting thing about this type is the fact that it has 14 different styles where each style has its own characteristics and weights. Each weight displays slightly different uh, personality and it has its own character, where for example, the light uh, font has open look, the regular is impact, Muscular and the ultra bold represents the heaviest font. Uh, for my type, I decided to choose Gill Sans Regular because of its classical style, which is the um, black outlined um, type that you see, and combine it with Gill Sans Ultra Bold, which, as you can see, is the black portions of the type uh, because of its cartoonish and playful features and characteristics. The skinnier body parts each, of each letter uh, have rigid qualities while the thicker and darker parts have soft and flexible materiality. Uh, the results of the relationship between each type starts to occur and take shape when the letters with rigid and soft body parts start to interact with one another. In this short clip, we can capture the notion of gravity and materiality when the two styles of Gill sense start to interact. And um, as well as in other examples, we can see how the form of the letters start to change when their body parts start to develop rigid and soft qualities, where Gill Sans Regular and Gill Sans Ultra bold are morphing together into one body. As a result, each letter has denser and skinnier body parts, which gives the type variety as well as complexity and materiality. So these are just a couple of examples, but we can see that um, the rigid parts are basically holding up the, the more flexible liquid parts that are kind of like reacting to the environment around them, which is the gravity or when interacting with another object. Uh, from the Stephen Hall Alphabetical City, I have studied the Oliver Building by Burnham Architects. For the project, I used distributed mass and circulation of this building and in incorporated it into my project. Later in the assignment, we studied the project through visual motions of plans and sections and quickly, quickly realized that the structure appears to develop liquid quality, qualities like seen in this video. So this is basically the section cuts of the plan. Um, and every time the, the section uh, changes, then the plan starts to look like it's developing liquid qualities. And the same thing refers to the section as well. Through combination of rigid and soft body parts of each letter, the project started to take shape when the two materials started interacting with one another in unexpected ways, which as a result gave opportunity to develop programs to the site. So for example, um, in this plan, site plan, we can see that a lot of different programs have been incorporated to the site, which gives variety for the people from other communities to come and interact with the people who live in the, in the public housing. Um, so for example, we have places like fitness, pool, picnic stage, open air cinema, and as well as other uh, recreational uh, places uh, for people to gather and interact. <clears throat> and this is just a view uh, uh, from the front, from the um, higher up, just to kind of like see the mass of the entire structure. And this is uh, the um, GIF video to kind of like show how the structure came together.
So the public housing apartments have been incorporated into rigid parts of the structure that represent the frame. The remaining parts of the letters change their shape and the form due to gravity and relationship with the ground and other rigid parts uh, of the structure. So in this short clip, we can see what happens when um, the frame uh, is basically holding up the black portions that uh, look like they're more liquid and uh, more, um, they have the materiality that you, people actually can touch and interact with. And moving forward, um, <clears throat> so in the plan, we can notice that the only elements touching the ground are the liquid portions of the letter body types. These soft body parts are meant for people to interact with through different types of playful activities and public spaces, whereas the housing unite, uh, unites the, uh, the housing is positioned above to create space between the public and private. So on the ground, people are able to socialize and gather, whereas the public housing is elevated up to create this kind of like a spatial boundary and give people more privacy. But at the same time, they're able to observe activities that are happening on the ground uh, level. So for example, we have the pool over here, open air cinema. Uh, this is the skate park. This is the playground for kids. And uh, these two central elements represent the running track and the fitness as well as their little different um, programs incorporated into this plan as well, like a little stage picnic area, um, the sculpture park. And in this uh, image, we can just see the zoom in plan on focusing on the running track and the fitness, as well as um, other areas of the fitness that are meant for people to utilize like the restrooms or showers. And over here, um, so in this zoom in plan, we can see the housing apartments incorporated into the rigid frame, which allows uh, the residents to observe activities that are occurring below them, as well as gives them easy access to, to move throughout uh, from one frame to another, and then um, also are able to um, use vertical circulation to move from one level to the, to the level to the other level that is located above. Um, in this section, uh, this section well represents the relationship uh, between the rigid and soft uh, parts of the structure, as well as shows the movement, uh, the moments of the two parts uh, colliding together. So for example, here we can see the frame again, and then um, we can see that the uh, stair circulation is represented here, so it allows people to move from one level to another. Uh, this bar over here is uh, the um, the exhibition space, so people can easily move from the housing unit to the exhibition space, as well as exhibition space is um, also open for public, so people can um, uh, easy access to that space as well. And um, And then this section that didn't appear, just a moment. In the second section, uh, we can see the cut through the exhibition space. And um, we can see that basically people are able to move from one area to another uh, every time there is an ex exhibition and display art. And, um, and then you can see that there's kind of like resting upon the housing units so people are, can access very freely. Um, this is just one elevation showing um, the playground over here and the pool. And the other elevation is showing the open air cinema and it's showing the, um, as well as showing the skate park and uh, climbing wall and rental bike place, which is located over here. And there is a video that I'm not sure why I didn't play, but I'm going to play it right now. It's right here. Um, so in this video, this clip, uh, we can see the typical kitchen window from, from the residences. Um, and we can see how the housing okay. 
um, we can see how the housing uh, housing for people have more like a domestic look, um, typical house, where is the environment it creates kind of like a contrast between the two worlds. And we can also see objects that people used uh, back in the day when people were utilizing and living in public housing. And um, you can see these typical, very domestic objects that people use every single day. And then moving forward. Um, these are just a couple of renderings, but I really wanted to um, kind of like zoom in and sh show a little bit more of the areas that are happening uh, uh, within the site. So again, we can see how the, um, uh, fr the frame, which is located above, is kind of like wrapped around the T uh, that is kind of like holding the two uh, frame parts together, which uh, now allows them to move from one level to another. But um, the central area over here is the stage where people can um, uh, do any kind of different activities um, as well as little, little plays and performances. In this view over here, um, we can see how, again, the deform and um, transformation of letters, when it, what happens when, when um, the gravity occurs and uh, the compression as well. So we can see this letter I has been like smooshed a little bit, but now it's kind of like have different readability in a way. Um, and this view just shows basically the staircase utilizing and going up to the um, to the housing units. And over here, we can also see a open air pink open space ping pong for people, for kids. Um, this area is focusing on the public pool. So um, there's tubes that basically are um, incorporated into a frame so people can uh, use the tubes and, and jump into the pool or they can do um, different types of things. Um, but basically the idea is for the people to touch and feel and interact with the architecture that surrounds them. And over here, this is just another view but it shows another area of the ping pong um, uh, space. And then it's kind of like hanging on top of the E, sort of like very, very restless and effortless. And I also have a couple of clips just to kind of um, show like um, everyday life, how people lived. Uh, and again, this is um, the tube that I was talking about, how it's basically connected into the frame. So you can go up and then you can slide down to the pool and this little um, deformed hashtag symbol is actually the little tubes that you can go directly into the pool. Um, but this is kind of like the minimal representation or visual of the pool. Alex, maybe while you play these, we can we can have the critics just kind of dive in um, just so we have enough time for, for our comments. You can yeah. play through them. Uh -huh. And this is just a play, uh, playground area. So again, people use the architecture and then they, um, they use it for um, interaction and touching and feeling. Um, so this area is located right next to the pool. And then over here, um, this is the skate park that I was talking about, as well as the climbing wall and the rental bike place. So I located them next to together. Um, so then people can utilize them easier. They don't have to go far to find these places. And um, that's it, thank you. Well, um, Alex, what I find really intriguing about your project is uh, kind of similar to uh, Alejandro, where I think that you used typography to create new typologies. I think that's a super smart move. Um, and I think that you really have created new housing typology, something we haven't seen before. And I also really think it was strategic to work with these two readings of your uh, typography, the kind of part soft, part hard, and then deploy them in um, a, a sort of strategic way on the site, which has to do with giving a, a kind of more three-dimensional uh, quality to the exterior volumes that you make. So I really think that the way that you have distributed these um, components across the site creates, you, you really have focused on the outdoor space uh, and it's clear that was an interest of yours. 
uh, given your animations and the views that you show us, like it really comes across what you were striving for. And I, I really think you achieved it. Um, I think it's really, really great. Um, for Brian, what I enjoyed about your project was that you, um, the way that you really interp reinterpreted the tape in the end to more massive condition of these, let's say strips. So I think when you start to turn your tape into the building mass and you give it um, a dimension, I think this is really great where it starts to actually like you, the wrinkles of tape start to be seen in the kind of thickness of the building. And so what I really wish is that that dimension, that volume, that um, like feeling of the materiality of the tape had then gotten um, reapplied back to the site. Like I think when we see the site plan and the reading of quote unquote, the tape on the site plan, it's too thin, it's too straight, it's too, it's not, it doesn't have a kind of dimensional conditions that it does in the building. So I feel like if I were you, the thing, the piece that I would maybe rethink a little bit on your project is the way that you, the way that you think about that tape back onto the site as a set of paths, at a set, as a set of places. I think the kind of dimensionality that it has in your building it could take on some of that dimensionality in the site and, and, and not just be a set of lines anymore. Like I think in your building, you really made it the, the tape kind of something, a, a set of um, masses. And I think, you know, the, the site could have gotten like topography. It could have gotten, the paths could be thicker. Like, I, I just think that, you, and I think what happened was you worked so much on the building that then the paths, you went back to the site plan at the end is my guess. And it kind of just, you didn't have as much time left over for the site plan. But I think if you were to take the site plan farther, you could imbue it with some of the characteristics of the buildings and it would be really great. Which I think is in yours, Alex, it's, there's like a real, the attention you give to the ground plane, the attention that you give to the mass, the attention that you give to the void, it, it it's, there's a real um, like balance in your project of mass and void that I think is really great. Yeah, I think, uh, I think both these projects, you guys um, introduce a material and physics to the transformation of the type, um, as well as a kind of redefinition of the parts uh, of the individual letter forms. I think that that's given the project a lot of mileage. I think in Brian, in your case, it's you know, it's, it's quite sophisticated. I think yours is the one that um, leaves the legibility the most, like the letter forms are no longer legible in the end. And it's this, this complete um, new kind of uh, massing uh, language on the site. I mean, I guess perhaps like the, you know, the, the, the comment of, of getting more of the tape action on the ground, it might be that it's more about the mass to ground relationship. So the way that in some of the letter forms that tape, you know, the tape casually crosses over, one can imagine that it does that on the ground as well. Like some of the tape might lift, lift up a little bit and, and, and hit some of the, the massing um, in order to, in order to kind of um, break the, the binary of, this is mass, this is ground kind of logic. But I think otherwise it's it's a really sophisticated, well-executed project. Um, and, and then Alex, I, yours is really compelling as well. And I think there's, I mean, uh, in a lot of ways, the the overall um, kind of casualness and kind of ad hoc uh, nature of the massing that actually produces uh, this um, public, space that offers, you know, multiple ways of, of using it, I think is, is working really well. And the, uh oh, I think that's an, is that an alarm? Oh, it's an alert. Sorry, we have a public safety alert here. You heard that, sorry. We're handing um, our, um, our internet issues to you, maybe. Made it to LA. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, so I think that in yours, Alex, the, the kind of uh, div division of the letter form into this kind of 
rigid member and then this kind of soft elastic member, I think got, got you a lot of mileage. The thing that maybe, you know, I, if I were you, I would suggest looking at um, more closely, like if you were to continue this kind of uh, project is maybe finding a way to break the binary um, so that it doesn't read like, here's the serious architectural stuff and then here's the playful architectural stuff. And I was, I was thinking like, you know, there's, there's many ways of doing this. And I was trying to think like, okay, the least aggressive way might be that right now the, the material coating, like this kind of tan material and then the black shiny stuff is maybe where the crux of the problem is. So one could imagine that I, I don't think it's about making it all the same, but it might be that uh, because you're you're kind of treating the black gooey stuff as almost like tar or a tire tube or something like that, that it, you can imagine that it begins to stain some of the surfaces of the other one when it comes into contact. And so some patches of black might occur in the near area so that the figural distinction becomes less noticeable or less legible. I think that would be like a like a, a low level kind of transformation so that you keep the the um, differences between them intact, but you remove some of the legibility and the codification of them. Uh, I, th I think that, that would be um, um, really interesting. The other thing that I think is really interesting about yours is, you know, We've been talking about uh, this issue of whether, you know, okay, we're using letters. If the letters are legible, should it spell something? Like, how do you, you know, is there some kind of implicit meaning across these? What, what's interesting about yours, and because you use um, other characters besides letters, it, it actually reminds me of, um, uh, you know, the random passwords that Google produces for you, just like crazy exclamation mark. So, which is a, which is a contemporary code, you know? And so this becomes like a, not something that sends a message, but that creates a kind of string or cluster of characters that is parallel to something that we experience in digital culture, you know? That's a funny comment, um, Ramira. I had a thought earlier today for the first time on one of the projects in the first half that it reminded me of the thing that you have to type in to prove you're not a robot. Right. Oh, right. Yes, right. Yeah, that's another one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a super interesting thought, yeah. uh, Ramiro, about it too. Like to to say that there are there's a new kind of coding that always mm -hmm. that doesn't always make a message that we understand, but is something. Right that's still like a legibility of some sort. Right. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. or we can identify it, not because of its meaning, but because of its association to uh, security or you know, online issues and all that stuff. Yeah, that's interesting read. Mm -hmm. A really interesting project, so fascinating. Yeah, I think maybe just a, one more thing about Brian's, I think the, the read on it, Ramiro, that it's sophisticated is, is really funny, right? Because it's, intended to be so crude and kind of quick. Mm -hmm. And I think Brian would, would agree that crudeness, the effect of crudeness or the aesthetic of quick is like so hard. <laughs> yeah, right, right. That is like really, really difficult, so. Yeah, no, it sure is, yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, think especially, when you, especially when you think about like scaling up from something that is more a model logic, like Tate, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so maintaining it's like maintaining the crudeness, but it's not literal, you know? And so right. I think that's, that's part of the challenge. Um, the, the way that it's like kind of wiggles around and plan, like to me, it made me think like, I just wish there was a little bit of that, like, you know what I mean? In, in the ground plane where there was, I just wish there was like moments where it would go down a little bit and go up a little bit. Right. So it was like a little bit that, that, almost crudeness that we see in the wall, if that started to like happen on the ground. Mm -hmm. Almost like taking the, when it was facade, taking yeah. it, you know, which actually there was right. a version of that, I think at the midterm, but the, that kind of never made its way back in. Margaret, you diagnosed it perfectly too, that the, the kind of site plan logic was definitely transplanted kind of late um, 
into this stage of the, the project. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's 617 here. It's 417 there. Um, so I don't want to keep you any longer. Thanks for doing overtime when I know you're, you've started your summer. Um, yes. <laughs> hopefully you, uh, you were entertained for a bit. Um, your comments were invaluable and so great for um, the students to have as they head out into, maybe they'll go to LA, I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, or somewhere. Um, but thank you both so much for your time and it's great to see your faces. Um, I know the students, they also have faces, uh, most of them. So, <laughs> not always, but um, sure. thank you both so much for, for sharing your afternoon with us. Sure, my pleasure. Yeah, thanks. It was super fun. Super fun to, um, I don't know, be in a different place for even an afternoon. Yeah, right. Um, my, big, my big thing now is waiting for my Whole Foods delivery. So. <laughs> We've got some time before dinner. Yeah. Yeah, time, so. Well, congratulations, everyone. Yeah, congrats. Really nice to see you all. Great. Thanks. I'll see you both soon. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Students, you can stay on for a minute if you can. All right. Let's see. Let's um we'll stop the uh live